So I think we are online now. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to the first Dutch LabVIEW user group online session. Uh, my name is uh, Pascal Heinen and I will be your host uh, for today. Um, before we start with our presentations, I have a few things I want to uh, talk about. Uh, the first of which is the agenda. We have three nice presentations, one of uh, Martin Vernhout. Um, he will be talking about acquisition for the practical uh, engineer. Then we have a small coffee break. Jeff Kodowski will then be speaking which, um, with uh, or about the target structure and uh, channel and the channel research that he is doing, which is amazing. I had a sneak peek and it's, it's yeah. Then we have another break and then I will be doing a code review uh, for a hobby project that I did uh, for Tetris on uh, FPGA. Um, let me see. Yes. So first about us, um, we are the Dutch LabVIEW uh, user group. We were founded in uh, 2017. Um, and uh, since then, we have uh, been doing four meetings uh, in person a year in Eindhoven. Um, and this online session is because of the recent developments uh, that is going on all over the world. I'm pretty sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. And we thought, let's do it online and let's make it available for, uh, for everyone, especially for people who never went to a user group. Because a user group is very important. Uh, at the user group, you will meet your peers. You will meet other left view programmers and you will be able to learn from them, which is really, really important if you want to uh, excel at your job and just make uh, progress in your, um, uh, in, in your work. Um, beneath at the PowerPoint sheet, PowerPoint sheet, you will see uh, the people who made this happen. Thank you very much, everyone. It's, uh, it's almost impossible without uh, these people, so thank you. Um, and for the people who do not know what a user group is, it's uh, a meeting of LabVIEW enthusiasts. Uh, and it looks a little bit like you see here. It can be uh, at a um, social gathering or at a company. Uh, people from different uh, companies will gather there and present their LabVIEW experiences, talk to each other. You can network there. And um, this is how you can keep your LabVIEW knowledge at a, at a high level and stay up to date with the recent developments. Even for the lone LabVIEW programmer, this is very important because one tip or one library, one package that is shown at a, at a user group can help you so much in your daily work that you can solve problems that you um, maybe deemed impossible in the past. So for the loan programmer, this is a very important platform to, uh, to do. So when I quote uh, Chris Shilino, so I hope I'm not butchering his last name. Sorry, Chris. Uh, a LabVIEW user group is a small local gathering of LabVIEW enthusiasts who want to gain experience in programming with LabVIEW and or the NI platform in the context of a community. So there are multiple LabVIEW user groups in the world. And if you want to find one that is uh, in the neighborhood from where you are working or where you live, please go to the uh, NI uh, website, go to the community, the user groups, and then the local user groups. You will also find the URL of this uh, webpage in the description of the YouTube channel for your convenience. There are, I think, hundreds of, uh, of LabVIEW user groups. Try to find one in your neighborhood and go there. It's it's really amazing. Now with the le uh, recent developments in the world, maybe some are only online. But um, yeah, try to uh, to connect with uh, other LabVIEW enthusiasts and uh, and start learning. Also, if you cannot find a LabVIEW user group, maybe it's an idea to um, start your own user group. And uh, when I go one sheet back, the LabVIEW user groups built to last by Chris is a very good resource to um, figure out how you can, uh, can do that best. So at uh, the Dutch LabVIEW user group, we meet four times a year. We have uh, typically two presentations. Uh, we have one presentation, then a discussion, 
then we have a social uh, platform where we eat something, where we uh, talk to each other, etc. Then we go back to the room and we do the second presentation. And all presentations are done by volunteers, uh, like the presentations that are done uh, today in the group. So um, you will be able to um, watch the presentations but if you have a, a good topic or maybe you want to do a code review of the code you are doing at work um, that can also be a good um, topic for a, an, a user group meeting um, then about uh, this uh, stream we have three presentations and during the presentations you can ask questions in the youtube chat uh, the chat is monitored. Uh, I have a team in the background here uh, who are monitoring the, the chat and gathering all the, the questions. Then at the end of each presentation, if there is time, uh, we will answer a few, uh, hopefully all questions, but uh, at least a few. Uh, and if your question is not answered, please send your question to um, dotlag at uh, vitech.nl and we will make sure that uh, we forward it to the presenter and you will get uh, your answer. And then uh, lastly, recertification points. It is possible to get five recertification points towards your CLD, CLA, or CLED, um, which will help you recertify. If you have 50 points, you do not have to do the recertification exam, but your um, certification will be prolonged for um, uh, the period that the uh, different certifications are uh, permitted. So the CLD is, uh, I think, four years, CLA, CLA is five years, and the CLED is six years, if I'm correct. I could be mistaken. Um, but for just watching this, uh, this stream, you can get five points. Send an email with your name, email address, and the certification you want the points awarded uh, towards to uh, again dotlog at vitech.nl and I will make sure that um, it is forwarded to Natural Instruments and you will get um, yeah, the points awarded. Uh, we will do nothing else with this, uh, uh, with this information. After I forwarded uh, all your information, I will delete your email and not use it. Um, and then if you will be visiting um, other user groups, or you will be presenting in a user group, you can also gain five points or 10 points uh, for presenting. So five points for attending and 10 points uh, for presenting. Okay, so I have to look in the chat one second. Okay, I think that's it. So um, Martin, are you there? I'm trying to yes, connect to I Martin. Am. Ah, hello. I will stop my stream, let me stop share. Yes. Hi. How are you doing? Hey, good. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Thank you for volunteering. All right. Not a problem. Not a problem I, at all. I have seen your sheets. We're in for a very nice presentation. Oh, I made a lot of slides. So uh, we'll see how we can do uh, with the most, uh, the, the biggest enemy of, you, of us all, which is not Corona, by the way, but it is time, time pressure. So. Time pressure. Then I will yes. let you start. I will leave the, sheet, uh, the stream. All right. So yes. at the end of the stream, we will do the questions. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I'll take over. Yes. All right. Um, yeah. Welcome. Um, the Dutch user group meeting for LabVIEW. Um, as, uh, as Pascal already mentioned, it's about LabVIEW programming, um, but it's also about measurement techniques and everything which is related in the field of test and measurement. Um, so today's session, 20 to the 22nd of uh, July, that's your poor man's approximation of pi, just for the, uh, the tech nerds uh, among us. All right, I have a lot of slides um, and we will go through them uh, at a fairly high pace. Um, we'll see how we do uh, with the time and uh, let's get started. So my name, Martin Vernout. I am currently a teacher mechatronics at the mechatronics department of Fontes University of Applied Science here in uh, Eindhoven, the Netherlands. I'm also pre a principal uh, uh, engineer at Dialog Semiconductor. Um, of course, this is on my own title, and uh, it's just that you know a little bit about the background of me. All right, um, the presentation outline. Today, um, 
I, I needed to give uh, the speech a talk and it was uh, lessons learned about data acquisition for the practical engineer. And that practical engineer means that you studied the theoretical part, you did practical training, you dare to experiment and you love the insight. So you can gain insight by doing experimentation and trying it not from the expert, uh, not from the math point of view, but really uh, looking at the results and trying to figure out what's happening. Um, Everybody uh, or most of you might already have used DocMix, uh, the data acquisition driver from National Instruments. Um, it's fairly easy to start acquiring signals and take some measurements. There is much more to taking a measurement. Uh, we talk about quality, about uh, what you're trying to accomplish, what you gain from it. And in this talk, I will definitely discuss a little bit of theory, uh, give a lot of attention. Um, so tips and tricks. Uh, they are uh, on, uh, on a lot of slides, actually. All right, so always at the beginning, we start with a disclaimer. So I will definitely open and show you a lot of open doors. Um, based on your background, uh, most of the material is already known for you. Otherwise, uh, you might find some slides interesting. I'm hoping, actually, that by the end of the presentation, you have found at least three things that you either already knew and now it is confirmed or that it is new or that it gives you just a hint of new insight a different way of looking at it i know there are many slides and i have used simplifications i definitely have omissions um, if i make mistakes they are mine alone and i'm alone to blame um, and if you think that i did something really smart i must have seen it somewhere else so uh, don't credit me for it Every presentation um, should at least be, in my opinion, as, as a teacher, be inspiring, entertaining, creative. Uh, I, I'm making mistakes uh, and it is a bit of storytelling. Um, and that's actually the joy of presenting. So if you are going to attend a user group and you're going to present yourself, um, don't worry, uh, everything is okay. Uh, as long as you're trying to convey a message, what you've done in the past, the problems you faced, even this is what I did wrong uh, can be truly helpful for other people. Um, all right. So the fair use is I use a lot of material in these slides and I have no clue on where it came from. Um, so I'm, I'm using the fair use policy. Um, um, that means if I found it via Google, I can probably find it back again. Um, but uh, um, it is uh, fair use, non-commercial and freely distribu distributable. All right, so let's get started. Um, measurements, the topic is about measurements and no measurement is exact. Whatever you do, uh, it will always be an approximation of something which is real out there. Um, that also means that if you have no clue on how exact your measurement is, um, your result might be worthless. If you cannot base a high quality decision on it, it is as good as an informed guess, uh, as, uh, as Walter Lewin uh, posted. And I put here his quote, uh, to the best of my knowledge. So if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. That's the opposite side. Um, that's why we measure. We measure so we know that we're doing the right thing, or we measure so we can get a truly uh, good value on how to make it better. Uh, what kind of signal processing do you need? Right, so doing measurements the right way is our goal. Um, so if you do not care about the accuracy and the meaning of what you just measured, then everybody can call themselves an expert and it's fairly easy to get some data into your computer. You've done a measurement. Wow, you're on the roll. Well, in the real world, um, and that's maybe the, the downside of it all, um, you will find that there are many more things which can magically, uh, which are going wrong, than magically go right by themselves. And that, uh, that ultimately uh, <laughs> uh, goes into, uh, um, into the quality of the measurement. Um, you need to do a lot of things right before you can actually prove to yourself and to others that the measurement is of high quality and you can make the decisions you want with the data. All right, the agenda for today. Um, it will be a, a, a connection of topics. 
Um, I have some words about the DocMX driver because this session will not be about DocMX, but it will definitely use DocMX. Uh, we do a bit of sampling theory, multiplexed ADC, accuracy, precision, and resolution, and then some um, examples which go through the process of which mistakes can you make, how can you make it better, um, DC and AC estimation, frequency analysis, uh, transfer function as a large example. Uh, we spent most of the time in there and signal insight. All right, DocMX. If you've not learned, uh, uh, if you've not used DocMX before, you probably haven't used a data acquisition device from National Instruments. So the moment you start uh, using a multifunction I/O device or some analog input module, you are uh, uh, going to use DocMX or uh, the traditional Doc driver. It's a simple and intuitive API. Um, it has a flat learning curve and there are tons and tons of examples out there on how to do the things you want to do. Um, that means if you want to get started with DocMX, visit the ni.com website. There are great articles on how you get started, 10 functions that do 80% of the work, advanced programming, the manuals are there, and example VIs. The moment you install DocMX, you probably are entitled to a lot and lot of examples and please have a look at them. Uh, they are created for a reason to educate you on how to do it. So DocMX is a very capable and robust driver for any hardware and today we will only be scratching the surface. Um, don't worry, uh, we will only look at analog input and analog output, but it's not the focus of today. Um, we will be using DocMX, but it's not that you will be learning everything there is to know about DocMX, because that will not uh, be uh, fitting within the time slot. Um, and we're not diving into special type of sensors and calibration procedures. We keep it easy. But still keeping it easy, uh, there is lots to learn. And let's start by a little bit of theory um, on sampling theory. If we talk about sampling, we talk about digitizers. And digitizers, uh, they, uh, they perform sampling. Sampling is the process of generating the discrete time samples from an analog signal. Whatever the analog signal is, uh, that means it's continuous in time and in amplitude. That's the analog part. And it's going to create uh, specific samples in time. Um, Sometimes very fast, millions of samples per second at a steady pace. Sometimes very slow, maybe once a, once a minute, maybe once an hour. Uh, you could still call that, uh, that sampling, of course. And the main workhorse there is your analog to digital converter, your ADC. And that's how we will uh, abbreviate it. The output code has an error compared to the analog continuous input signal because uh, uh, it will be a finite uh, number of levels which it can identify. Um, the resulting error in the approximation of the analog continuous signal will be your quantization error. And there are many things which can go wrong. We can have an offset error in your analog to digital converter. That means the code coming out does not reflect the actual level, but a little bit of plus and a little bit of minus. You can have gain errors. That means if the value is doubled in the real world, it might be more than doubled or less than doubled. In the, uh, in, the, in the math domain as a number. Uh, we can have non-linearities or linearity errors, um, and they are often expressed as integral and dynamic uh, uh, INL and DNL. And we have problems with settling time that if you do something really fast, it might not be a precise, accurate representation of the value of that analog signal at that point in time. So, if we have errors in the value, we can also have errors in time. Because if you sample at the wrong time and your value, your signal in the, uh, in the, in the world is changing, uh, you're looking at something which is not linked to the time slot. So we can express it as a level error. And that means the number of bits, the number of uh, quantization levels in your ADC actually is also linked to the amount of jitter, uh, time variance, on your sampling clock. Um, every or most of the analog to digital converters actually operate uh, with a track and conversion cycle. Um, 
that means um, for converting the signal, the analog signal to a digital signal, it requires time. And in that time, you don't want your analog signal to vary. And that means you sample it, you keep it the same, and then you move on. Uh, this periodic freaks needs to be very accurate and fast, otherwise the conversion result will suffer from it. And that also means that there might be a little bit of settling uh, and kickback to the driving circuit. Well, normally this is taken care of by the vendor of your digitizer, of your ADC or multifunction uh, duckboard. Uh, sometimes you actually see the results of this uh, track and conversion settling time uh, back into the measurement specification. So in a nutshell, we go from continuous to time and level discrete. We sample at specific po uh, points in time. In here, over here, it is actually, uh, let me put on the, uh, the laser pointer here. It is actually collecting data at specific time points here, T1, T2, T3, and T4. And also the level itself is now quantized. That means we need to talk about ADC resolution and quantization error. And the resolution of, an, of a converter simply indicates uh, the number of discrete values it can produce. And by a stroke of luck, uh, we're using in, the, in, in digital, we use almost everywhere the, the power of two, um, you will find that the number of quantization levels, the number of uh, discrete values, which can be produced from an analog input source is always expressed as two to the power of something. And that something is the number of bits in your ADC. Um, now, if your ADC can convert signal from zero to one volt and you only uh, supply one to two millivolts, you're not using your digitizer, you're not using your ADC to the best uh, possible outcome. So what do you need to do? You need to get your signal into the range of your analog to digital converter. So either you change the level of your ADC, your reference level, which is often not operated that way, or you amplify your input signal. That's uh, how, how easy it is. So if we are starting to sample, we know some errors are to be made in the, uh, on the vertical axis, the, 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 the value axis. We also are looking at time sampling. And it is important that for a faithful reproduction of the original signal, that's only possible if the sampling rate is higher than twice the highest frequency of your signal. Otherwise, you're undersampling and you might not know precisely what your signal looked like. And most of the signal processing actually assumes that you're sampling fast enough. And there is always a downside. If you sample faster than fast enough, you have more data. Uh, so you need to compute more. Um, other problems are if the bandwidth of your input circuit is higher, you get more noise and you pay probably more for an, uh, a fast digitizer for a slow one. All right, so we talk about signals which we are going to, uh, to acquire. And for that, we have signal to noise. The signal to noise basically says, how good is your signal over or stronger than the, uh, the random fluctuations which you cannot control? And all those signals are actually named noise. Um, a good signal, that means there is no noise in the background or um, uh, it is not influencing, influencing your measurement in a very uh, uh, poor way. If you do that on an ADC, because that's making an approximation of your input signal, it's making a tiny error each and every time that looks like noise and your signal to noise ratio is at most that formula which is given over there and it's expressed in decibels. So the 1.7 plus 6N uh, gives you a rough estimate of the uh, the accuracy, which is inherent to all the ADCs. It will never be any better than that value. Um, so if you need 90 dB, you can at least approximate the amount of bits, effective number of bits you want from your digitizer to, uh, to work. So we are sampling. And what happens if there are signals which are above your Nyquist frequency, which is half that frequency where you are sampling at. Um, well, if there are frequencies over there, um, for example, over here, that noise 
spike on the right side of your Nyquist frequency, which is half the sample frequency, that one will actually be mapped back within the fundamental range uh, to your Nyquist frequency. And you cannot tell the difference. You don't know if it was actually there or that it was coming from somewhere else. Uh, we call that aliasing. And the moment you have digitized your signal and that alias exists, there is no way that you can remove it again. You don't know where it came from. Um, but let me explain that in the next slide, please. So if the continuous uh, uh, frequency domain looks like uh, this, we have uh, a couple of uh, zones, zone one, two, three, four, and they are in half multiples of uh, the sample frequency. What we actually are looking at from a measurements perspective is only at that first zone. But it means this is like a, a fold up uh, system that if there are signals in zone two, they fold back um, and they fold back actually uh, mirrored. Zone three basically gets overlapped with zone one. Zone five gets overlapped with zone one. Zone four gets overlapped with zone one, but mirrored again. And that means you're looking at this. Now, how do you spot your original signal where you know that your signal should have been, which is in the range of uh, uh, zero to sample frequency divided by two, your Nyquist frequency. So there is one simple solution. We need to get rid of all these higher frequency terms. And we do that by low pass filtering, or we can change it by increasing the sample rate. So we call that uh, first zone the baseband signal, and that has frequency uh, components which start at DC, uh, F is zero, and extend up to some maximum frequency. Two solutions, low pass filtering and increasing the sample frequency. And if you do not filter and you know that there is some aliasing to occur, um, you can basically estimate what your measurement uh, resolution will suffer uh, because of that aliasing effect. And if you then still say, I don't care, uh, well, then that's your measurement. Uh, you, you take the penalty of uh, aliasing uh, signals uh, getting back into the basement part. All right. So analog to digital converters, uh, part of your digitizer, what else can go wrong? Well, what else do you need to do? You need to connect your physical real world signal there. And there are various ways to do it based on uh, uh, Differential, single-ended, reference single-ended, non-reference single-ended, uh, floating uh, sing signal sources and grounded signal sources. And if you mess up, if you do not use the right one, you will get a not optimal result. Sometimes you sacrifice a little bit of that because it's just easier to connect a reference single-ended signal and then have many of them. Um, Sometimes you want best, and then you might go for differential signaling. All right. So there are a lot of things which actually can go wrong, and you need to care about if you want to take your first measurement. Um, let's go for an example of a multiplexed ADC. So we have one digitizer, and we have five channels, or 10 channels we want to measure. So what we normally put in front is a multiplexer. That's a, a fastly operated switch, which will Make sure that your ADC is connected to channel zero, channel one, channel two, channel three, in a specific order which you might be able to program. Um, if you do that, um, your channels all need to be of the same amplitude. Your signals need to be strong so it matches the ADC input range. Or you want to have a gain stage in the middle, which can adapt to the range you specify for that channel. And approximately that looks like this. This is coming from an M-series uh, National Instruments Data Acquisition Multifunction Data Acquisition Board. And uh, well, over here, obviously, we have the ADC. That ADA spits out a lot of data, which needs to be buffered a little bit before it can be transferred to the, to the main memory. Before the ADC, we have a programmable gain instrumentation amplifier, a connection circuit, and a multiplexer. That multiplexer makes sure that the signals you want are feed it to the ADC. So one ADC does the conversion for multiple channels, obviously not at the same time. It needs to do that on a sequence base. So if you're doing that, we call that actually scanning. Um, sometimes that uh, programmable gain instrumentation amplifier 
um, needs to adapt to a new signal each and every time it hops from channel one to channel two. And therefore it needs to settle, it needs to get stable, it needs to actually do what it is supposed to do, and that is a gain multiply, uh, a gain factor multiplied by your input signal. And it normally takes time. Uh, we call that settling time. And therefore, um, if you have a fast system and you make it run a little bit slower, it might be a little bit more accurate because it has the time to settle to the desired film. Now, multiplexers contain switches. It's a fast switch. And uh, that leads to ghosting. If you ever run into this one, you know probably what I'm talking about. But it looks like that two channels, they have something in common. Channel one, which is sampled slightly after channel zero, for example, might be influenced by what happens on channel zero. So channel one, the measurement result, but even the actual data in the real world is influenced by what's happening there in channel zero. And that's because of uh, charge, uh, uh, accumulated charge in your switch, which gets moved around and the, uh, the the easiest way I can make it uh, make you look at it is over here we have a mux between channel zero and channel one. They are sampled to the ADC in the gain stage periodically. That means first channel zero is sampled at three volt. Then the switch is operated to go to switch uh, to channel number one. Um, and a little bit of the energy it picked up from the three volt is now being pushed to channel number one. If I connect a capacitor over there, which is of course a strange thing to do, but it's just a high impedance source, um, a little bit of that charge is actually going to charge up or uh, uh, charge the capacitor. So the voltage on channel one will grow. And it's really this what is what is happening. Um, that charge injection is a, is a pain in the butt. Um, it's just what it is. Um, and you get it for free if you have a multiplexed analog uh, to digital converter. So uh, this is what you get. Now, the problem, of course, is will it be noticeable in your final application? And most of the times, that's not the case because this is a high impedance source. Uh, uh, normally, you drive an analog uh, digitizer with a low impedance source. So it's a strong voltage, which is reflecting what you have measured, uh, probably by adding an op pump, a buffer, or something like that. Um, but if you happen to measure high impedance sources, uh, uh, ghosting becomes apparent. And there are some ways that you can find out if you are suffering from ghost. So how do you know if you're hunted by a ghost? First, change the level of the previous sample channel and see if that makes a difference. And number two would be uh, change your sample rate because that charge injection happens at the sample rate. So if you run it for 10,000 times a second or 50,000 times a second, um, when you operate it at 50,000 times a second, the charge uh, which you're moving around from channel zero to channel one is five times as large. So that will speed up the increase of the voltage on the capacitor five times. Simple as that. So if you have more money to spare or more money to spend or your measurement needs it, don't use a mux, go parallel. And there are also boards which have uh, multiple analog to digital converters for most of the channels. So they are called simultaneously sampling. And that means they can sample actually at the same time at the expense of having more ADCs. Good, give attention to. I told you this was about theory and a lot of give attention to use low impedance sources. If possible, make sure your uh, driving circuit on the digitizer is low impedance. So it can drive relatively high currents. Uh, then ghosting goes away and it also makes uh, the signal a little bit more robust. Use short high quality cabling because everything you cable in the outside world uh, is sensitive to crosstalk, pickup, etc. So keep it short. Um, and the capacitance of the cable can increase the settling time if it is not driven by a low impedance source uh, per se. Carefully choose your channel scanning order because with a multi-channel, uh, multiplexed ADC, we are switching from channel to channel and uh, we might be switching the gain as well. Um, and if we're switching from a large to a small input range, that 
increases the settling time for that channel with the, uh, the, the small input range, so the high gain. Avoid scanning faster than necessary, so you don't end up with too much data, uh, or that you are picking up more noise because your bandwidth is now higher. Make sure you sample faster than the Nyquist sample rate if you need to reconstruct your signal accurately. Not always needed, but if you want uh, to look at your signal in a frequency domain and you want to really know what's happening there, uh, make sure you're fast. And uh, you can add a low pass filter to remove the high frequency signals, which is often called the anti aliasing filter. Right, electronics to the rescue. What we suffer from most are ground loops. That means your ground. That's the, the zero volt node somewhere um, that is not uh, taken lightly. If this is your ground node and we have connected multiple paths, um, every bit of trace has resistance. Um, they actually sum up in the resistance they have in common. So careful that you don't create ground loops. Now, in the past, people would have said ground loops. Yeah, don't make sure that you have a high current flowing through uh, a common resistor. But high currents doesn't mean high power. Uh, high currents also come into play if you take a small capacitor and you drive it by a digital pulse. So something which is changing fast in a uh, uh, number of volts per, per time unit. So high DVDTs cause large currents. And if those large currents go to a common resistor, uh, that voltage drop across R2 in this case, will actually be picked up by your measurement system. So avoid ground loops. And there is a lot of documentation out there on how to prevent uh, ground loops. Inductance is also not your, uh, not your friend. Um, if you have a little bit of inductance in your return wire, for example, uh, over here near ground, uh, now each and every wire you create which carries a current will also be a little bit, uh, will also have a magnetic field, and therefore it has self-inductance. Um, if you have self-inductance, so it's not if you have it, you always have it, um, that can lead to ringing uh, and, and strange oscillations. Now, by adding a resistor in series, you actually dampen it, you make it slower. And if you make it slower, at least the signal is not so super wrong. Also look at the vertical scale here. If you dampen it, the measured voltage uh, goes to 3.3 volts. If it oscillates, because there is some uh, some energy stored in the uh, in the self in the in the in the inductance, you will see that the measured voltage can even be higher than your final voltage of 3.3 volt. It cannot effectively be double. So uh, you don't want to have inductance. So make sure that there are low inductance uh, uh, traces in your measurement system. Over here, you have the combination of your uh, resistance and inductance part. So if you make a ground node, a star point grounding. Um, you're all the better off. That's the way to go. Coupling is because there are high DVDTs and high DIDTs, uh, changes in voltage and changes in current, uh, they will cause coupling into your circuit. So the simple solution is prevent. Prevent two high DVDTs and DIDTs. Uh, high speed is not positive at all. Better make the signal a bit slower with slow rate control, for example. And uh, careful, uh, make sure that your layout is uh, in line. You could use twisted wires. Uh, they are not strange at all. They actually were invented by uh, Alexander Graham Bell a long time ago. And it's a very cheap solution um, to counteract the, uh, the influence of uh, uh, magnetic uh, fields. So very fast. No, just fast enough, please. Make it slow down. And we have sometimes uh, problems with transmission line effects. Uh, read it later. So give attention to short wiring, proper shielding. Make sure that you do it in the right measurement mode, single-ended, differential. Break your ground loops. Reject common mode noise. And root cause the crosstalk and solve it. Because if you leave it there, you do not have it under control. So. That leads to the first conclusion there. Don't take a measurement for granted if you want the result to be meaningful and not indicative. Uh, do not make expensive decisions on poor data. Sounds like an open door. I think it is, but it's good to state it anyway. Um, well, read this tip later. It's about reading the manual, and I think you should do it. 
uh, it's free information. Um, right now, I've talked about accuracy a couple of times, and I think it's more important to understand what it actually means. So what actually do you actually need for your measurements to become good enough so you can make decisions on it? What constitutes a good enough result? Sometimes you do not need an absolute accuracy, but relative accuracy. And therefore, we have logarithmic converters. And a logarithmic converter can do something very smart. Um, it can have a very high dynamic range converted to a smaller range by the sacrifice of moving an absolute error to a relative error. So for example, this one, uh, it can measure current from 100 picoamps to 10 milliamps. And now with simply adding a cheap ADC with a fixed gain, you can actually measure currents over a vast amount of, uh, of, of range, uh, up to 10 milliamps. But it will not always be uh, a perfect representation. It will be 1 or 2% error. So you can have a low current measurement, 2% failure. But you can also have a high current measurement of 10 milliamps with a 2% error. So the error remains the same relatively. In an absolute sense, obviously, it changes by the range. All right, so from now on in this presentation, everything we do is uh, uh, not suffering from analog issues anymore. We've done our job. Let's look at the data. Accuracy, precision, and resolution. Accuracy is the error between the real and the measured value. So uh, if you look at this uh, uh, this blazoon, um, this, uh, this target, um, you want to be in the center, obviously. That will give you a high accuracy. Precision is the spread of, uh, uh, so, so this one uh, in, the, in the quadrant number three, that gives you not a lot of accuracy because it's obviously not in the center of, uh, of the target, but they are nicely grouped uh, close by. So that's good repeatability or good uh, precision and a bad accuracy. And resolution is how far are you off the center? If you measure that in centimeters, uh, centimeter will be your resolution. If you measure it in millimeters, that will be your resolution. So precision is linked to repeatability. Um, how do you improve the precision? Well, uh, the precision of a measurement can be improved by oversampling. Um, it's a bit odd, because if it spreads, it spreads. But if you average, uh, a lot of the spreads will average out, and that's called filtering. So most of your measurements you do in the in the real world are uh, normal or Gaussian uh, shaped. And uh, you know that such a distribution like this is always presented by a mean value, the average value, and your standard deviation. Um, under the constraint that we have made enough random measurements, we can now estimate the real world spread. So if I measure uh, uh, five times an arrow, I can actually calculate the uh, the mean, that's the, uh, the the center of the of the arrows, and I can measure how far they are grouped apart, and that will tell me if it is a normal distribution or not. Now, most things in real life, uh, because of the central limit theorem, are normally or Gaussian uh, shaped. So sometimes we just need to add that as a given. So we could do is repeat a single shot measurement. If you're doing a repetitive single shot measurement, the first thing is, was the distribution actually normal? And you can test it. Just put your data into a VI, and that will tell you if, uh, uh, if it is uh, uh, nicely skewed or not skewed at all. Uh, that target shell you should be zero. And the uh, courtesies should be around three for a normal uh, uh, distribution. So it's not something to take lightly. I am assuming it's a normally distributed data. You can test your assumption by measuring it. So what happens if we move our 50 data points, for example, to 500 measurements? Well, we get a better indicative uh, value of the spread. So if I take a low number of measurements, I know that it's approximately five, and I'm not still sure what the underlying distribution is. If you take more measurements, the shape will be more noticeable. Okay, but taking a lot of measurements, of course, 
um, yeah, there is a penalty to pay for that. What we could do is instead of repeating that one point measurement, uh, we take a multi-point measurement. That means fastly collect data, uh, uh, let's say 500 samples, and not look at the distribution, but only at the average value. If we do that, um, all the values reported, there are less values reported because you've now uh, uh, collected, in this case, 100 samples 50 times instead of one times five, uh, 5,000 uh, measurements. Um, it looks like the spread is less, uh, but you can still calculate the standard deviation of the parent population uh, because your average will always look uh, uh, distributed smaller, uh, tighter together. So that's the statistics 101. Um, if you want to know something about uh, the measurement uh, resolution you have, it's sometimes linked to the number of measurements you take. Sometimes that's something you can do and eh? not always. But if you want your measurement to be twice as accurate, you need four times as much data. If you want to have it nine times more accurate, you need 81 or squared uh, number of measurements to make that happen. So it's inversely proportional to square root of n. So keep that in mind if you want to think about quality measurements and you want to make it uh, into the real world. So what happens if you have too low a number of measurements? Um, mean value and uh, standard deviation um, with the bell-shaped curve of the Gaussian distribution tell you something about the, uh, the confidence level. If you have not enough data, then you can't use plus or minus three sigma, for example. You need to do that in a different way. Therefore, you have the student's t distribution. And that leads to an important reading tip. If you have not enough data, or you're measuring only a couple of samples out of a big population, um, you make errors. And they are hard to spot at first, but uh, there is a good uh, document on the web it's called measuring a small number of samples and the free sigma fallacy please read it if you care about the quality of your measurement and you're not and you're not sure if you're making enough measurements anyway uh, this this document is actually tailored to semiconductor industry but i think it's more uh, generally valid uh, outside of that so know your basic statistics if you measure and use results for further processing and decision making you should be familiar with at least the basics Estimating AC and DC signals. Very simple example, still something to learn here. Let's say we have a signal in the real world, which is a DC level plus some AC variation. Right now, it's nicely shaped as a sine wave. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the most ideal case, of course. And you can understand that if you collect a lot of samples between time step one and time step two, and you sum all those values and divide by the number of samples you've taken, you get an average value. That's the definition of an average. But because that sign is strongly uh, going more positive than your average and lower than your average, um, that average is actually uh, influenced by how you end or how you start and end. So how do you measure or how do you differentiate the DC from the AC? Well, that cancellation is not perfect, so you could do something very simple acquire more. Because if you acquire a million times that sine wave, the influence of that last sine wave, which is sampled high or low at the end of, uh, of the period, uh, is not so important anymore. So you get diminishing uh, influence of that last bit of sine wave. But of course, your measurement time increases drastically. And there are smarter ways to do this. The smartest way is apply a window. If you apply a window and that window function is always symmetric and it starts and ends with a zero. So over here, your window function is that nice. Uh, yeah, it almost looks like a Gaussian shaped uh, normal distribution curve uh, that multiplies your incoming signal. And then you have that that strange peaky uh, signal uh, over there, which, uh, well, basically familiar, uh, looks a bit familiar, like a mountain uh, or something but then seriously uh, sign inspired. Um, can we then calculate it? Yes, we can. Um, 
we focus more on the middle, so the end effects are not used anymore. And by multiplying by the coherent gain and the equivalent power bandwidth, you can estimate your DC and AC value. So the first step would be calculate, uh, multiply by that filter, calculate your mean, subtract the mean from the original signal. Now we only have the sine wave left. There we apply the window again. We sum everything up. We do the RMS uh, thing. Uh, so we uh, we actually calculate the root mean square and ultimately we estimate what the AC value is. And that works great. It's it's a standard VI uh, when you buy LabVIEW. So uh, use it. Rules for improving your DC and RMS accuracy, um, follow the hints. So how much do you need? Well, you need a couple of sine waves. You need three, maybe five. Um, if you use a different filter, a low side load filter, for example, you can actually get six digits of precision if you have sine, five sine waves sampled. So it correctly predicts your DC and your AC. Um, and uh, yeah, if you don't do it, uh, you only have 1.5 digits of precision, which is, of course, poor. Alternatives? Yes, there are always alternatives. The first one is find or convert uh, to uh, to the frequency domain, uh, basically operate an FFT, and then uh, go and search and collect the power, and then, well, basically you know what the frequency is and what the, what the level is. Right, challenge alternative solutions. Um, sometimes the you you have a solution and you say well it's giving me okay-ish results but there might be a way better uh, solution for that uh, it worked for me in the past uh, prevents you from doing it better this time because if you made it okay-ish in the past um, you're happy with that okay-ish uh, carrying on in the future so discuss with your peers is for sure a good way to open up for improvement um, Effectively, as a teacher, I can always tell you that the process of communicating an ID, even if you don't solicit feedback, will help you cl uh, clarify and see it in a new way. And a famous quote I always uh, use is, why do good ideas prevent even better ones? Because you get stuck on the good idea that's prohibiting from making the leap to a better one. All right, short uh, sidestep for DACMX. What we are going to do is we have a couple of uh, examples ahead of us. And um, they will uh, start by configuring a channel, then checking for how many samples are available. If there are not enough samples available, we're going to delay for some time, then read the data and process it. That's a simple loop, and it looks a bit like this. So this is actually what DocuMix looks like. It's a collection of VIs with a lot of uh, constants of controls uh, connected. Most of the things you start with, like range, min, max voltage, or sample frequency, uh, or what's the size of my buffer, they are actually just a request. DocuMix knows better. It will adapt to your hardware need, or it will check um, what is the capability and what is smart. So there is some, some logic behind it. Um, if we are collecting data, we check how much data is there. We actually can calculate how much we need to delay for the rest of the data to get digitized. Then we simply read it, we do something with it. In this case, we just print it on the screen. Uh, we make a graph out of it and uh, we loop continuously because the moment we start acquiring data, you probably want to read it as fast or faster than it becomes available. If you don't, you end up with uh, data in memory, which gets filled and then it will uh, abort by an error. All right, so if you operate this one, you can actually find that by the amount of processing time you input, you will see some, some strange oscillations by uh, Windows or the DocMX driver. Um, and the simplest solution here is make sure that if you're using buffers, make them large enough. Windows is not super smart. Uh, DocMX is a smart driver and it has some, uh, yeah, some game plan of its own. Um, if you think it should be good enough, do not assume, but verify the assumption. If you think your buffer is large enough, put it to the test. Put a VI next to it, which is computing or cycling uh, uh, as fast as possible, or uh, start installing Office if you're acquiring data. If it's still working after the installation, 
and it didn't find uh, a problem with uh, you did not read the data fast enough, then probably your buffer is good enough. Uh, to improve yourself, we must not forget to verify that the assumptions uh, that we made can be verified and uh, yeah, keep them in mind. All right, let's do something fun. Let's go for the signal time frequency equivalence. Um, any time domain can be described as a sum of scaled shifted sine waves of different frequencies. This is uh, what the uh, Fourier transform uh, gives us. And we benefit from that greatly within uh, 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 signal analysis. So the FFT is a lot of things, but the most important one is it transforms your time signal to the average power per frequency. Um, and it, so you lose your time position info, but it assumes that your time signal is periodic. Periodic means that if this is what you have captured, the underlying math of your uh, Fourier transform actually assumes that it repeats infinitely. And then you see this, this big discontinuity over there. And as a general rule, all signals with an abrupt change, a discontinuity, will create high frequency components. You need a lot of sine waves working together to make this jump actually happen. So we have windows. Those windows functions are actually the same windows functions we've used for the DC and AC estimate. Um, each window has its own characteristics. And there are so many windows that they are, well, they all make it better, but they are there for a reason. So for example, if we have closely spaced sine waves, then you might want to go uh, for a uniform uh, window, which is no window at all, or a Hamming window. Um, if it is a sine wave or a combination of sine waves, a handing window will normally suffice. Um, may the best window win. Yeah, there are many windows and um, it's always a trick on how to think, uh, did, did I prove that I chosen the right one? So the FFT, if you perform an FFT, your time domain signal will become a frequency domain signal and the spectral line resolution will be uh, uh, divided by the number of uh, samples in your set. Let's see, zero padding. Zero padding, that's adding zeros to your signal, which seems to increase the N. And if the N increases, your spectral line resolution uh, gets lower, so you get more if you add zeros. But often when it sounds too good to be true, it's not true at all. Um, you actually do not gain any additional resolution. Um, it just looks that way. So what can we learn from looking at the frequency spectrum? Over here, I have a simple setup with a, a, a signal uh, generator, a data acquisition board, and a gain stage. And if I short the input and the output, this is what we measure in the frequency domain. So low values, minus 120, uh, means there is almost no power. This is actually the ground, uh, the noise floor of that uh, digitizer. If I only keep the input shorted, uh, the, so the output is actually driving it, I see a little bit of DC and a little bit of uh, signal being picked up from somewhere else. If I apply a 1.9 volt signal, but I still uh, uh, input, uh, I, I still short the, uh, the output, um, I see a little bit of leakage. This is the, this, the, there should be nothing being picked up because the output is shorted. So this is probably linked to grounding. If we have a small signal, on the generator part, um, you see in it at least a lot of signal over here, which is way more than the ground, the noise floor, which we had with shorted in and outputs. So that's coming from our generator. That means not our, that our generator is, is very bad, but it means there are some uh, uh, spikes above the noise coming from the generator. And you need to understand that this is the quality of the generator. Um, it also shows you that there is a strong third harmonic. That means if this is the fundamental frequency at three times that frequency, we call that the harmonic, we still find a little bit of power. And if we make the signal too strong, so if we apply more than two volts peak peak on an ADC, which is capable of sampling two volts peak peak, um, you see a lot of, uh, of, of uh, higher frequency components uh, being created, and that's because of clipping. So it does not look like a sine wave anymore, and then you need higher frequency components to counteract. Um, so what did we learn from doing that, that simple FFT? Well, 
what we have learned is that the data acquisition system seems to be clear. The function generator, the functional, the function generator is the major, major source of frequency content. There is some pickup and your generator has a strong third harmonic. Be careful with the output level. We could not have done this if we just looked at the, uh, uh, the time signal because those signals measured here are so tiny that they are in the random fluctuations in a couple of LSBs, a couple of least significant bits of your ABC. So the final example. The final example is I have a small amplifier. It does amplify two times or six dBs and there is some frequency dependent gain. Um, and actually the goal is let's measure the transfer function in order to grade if the amplifier is okay or not. We call that a Bode plot. Huh? It's, uh, this, this right side, the frequency and uh, phase uh, transition uh, of that amplifier, we call that a Bode plot. And the Bode plot graphs the frequency response of the system for magnitude, amplification, and the other one uh, for the phase. Now, if you want to measure the gain, you estimate the response amplitude, compare it to the input. So if you do that, you need to measure both the stimulus and the response, both the in and the output at the same time or nearly at the same time. And with DocMX, we do that by uh, operating an analog output uh, task, uh, which we run in synchronous to the analog input sample clock. So the moment the analog output starts, the analog input is, is running as well, uh, because actually it's the analog input which is making sure that the analog output gets clocked and then the waveform presented there will be outputted to the real world. So the setup for this measurement is again, I have that, uh, uh, that multifunction uh, data acquisition box. I have my op amp, I have a power supply, I've connected the wires. Let's see what happens. If you're running, by the way, analog input and analog output at the same clock, you might be worried about settling time um, and therefore you can operate the delay from sample clock delay uh, setting of DocMix. Have a read later. So the first solution would be very simple. The first solution is I create a discrete set of frequencies and it's called a multi-tone series. So my waveform which I'm going to generate is a sine wave, two sine waves, then for a different frequency, again two sine waves, a third frequency, again a couple of sine waves. And because we know that the transfer function looks like this, we don't need all the points, we just need enough points so they can be connected by linear interpolation and it looks the same as the transfer function. So maybe only 20 test frequencies are needed. Now in this case, it shows that for the lowest frequency, you actually claim a lot of time. For a higher frequency, you have less time. And that means that your power spectral density, the amount of power which is there on the frequency axis, so with the FFT in place, diminishes strongly with higher frequency. So the power here is uh, uh, around uh, minus 90. If it is over here, let's say minus, uh, well, minus 30, um, you can estimate the ratio of power at low frequencies to the power at the high frequencies, which is many thousands of times. We created a single uh, a step frequency waveform. So there is a little bit of calculations to make sure that it is nicely as depicted here in the time frame. Um, we actually find the frequency back within a subset of the data. And the whole idea is that we generate this, we capture the response, and we know by looking at the index, uh, the data value index, um, what the original sine frequency was, and then we are going to compare it for the stimulus and the response. And basically what comes out is our Bode plot. So we find the frequency, we estimate the level and the phase. Uh, we use the extract single tone VI, which performs very good on minimal data. Um, and we do the calculation. The calculation is we have our two channels, stimulus and response. We might shift one of the channels a little bit, one sample to compensate for the settling effect on the analog output. Uh, we find the frequency of interest. We perform a log operation. 
because normally Bode plots are expressed in logarithmic terms, so we can have a high dynamic range. We calculate the phase difference. Maybe we compensate for a calibration of a pass through of output to input. And the result looks like this. We have these dots. They are the actual measurement. And the dotted line in the background is actually the value estimated from simulation from a SPICE simulator. So that looks uh, uh, pretty good. And the funny part is that this is a very slow measurement. A lot of samples were generated. And most of the time is actually spent on the lowest frequencies because we needed to generate those sine waves at the low frequency part. So instead of placing them one after the other, we could run them in parallel. If we run them in parallel, it means the low frequency sign and the high frequency signs are all overlapping. And that's not a problem because our FFT will split them, will bin them out to the frequency components. That method is called multitone and it has many benefits, but it's also more sensitive to noise. So if you look over here, you can now find out that all the test frequencies, which are actually the spikes in the FFT plot, uh, they are of equal power. And you can actually also see that the noise is slightly increasing near the higher frequency side. So if you operate this one, um, you still need to search for a specific frequency component and that just got a bit harder because in the series case, you know that in this time slot, you only expect to find one frequency and you know which one it is. But if all, all those sine waves are overlapping, you might need to find the right one. And all frequencies are present because it's a parallel of all those signs. Um, so that sometimes leads to some spikes and these problems can actually be overcome quite simply. Uh, but right now, that's good enough for our proof of concept. You see that most of the points lie on the curve and there are some very strong outliers there. And they are actually always at roughly the same locations. Um, so instead of having a set of sine waves, we can do it in a, in a different way, which is a continuously varying frequency, which is called a chirp. Uh, because it sounds like a bird. Um, so it starts by having low frequencies and then gradually the, in, the frequency increases. And if you take the FFT of this signal, you will notice that all the signal frequencies are actually present. Um, over here, we just generated. It's a chirp VI coming from the signal generation palette. Um, so it's it's fairly cheap. I think it's always present. Our analysis doesn't need to find a frequency because all the frequencies are actually valid. We just calculate the FFT. The values go to uh, uh, an amplitude in RMS and a phase. We again calculate the logarithmic value 20 times because it's a voltage. The phase difference in a very similar way, we get this plot. So instead of having discrete frequency points, where we have find uh, where we have found the transfer function, we have them now for all frequencies. In order to plot it, I have uh, used the result from a spice simulation and converting it uh, converted it to an x y plot. So that's fairly simple to do. Um, but if you put this into your measurement loop, which I did, you're actually calculating and converting that same string from spice simulation back to the XY uh, uh, graphs again and again and again. And we better do green engineering. So we only do that once, but it still adapts nicely to modifications you make. So it's not as a constant, but it's a constant uh, copy from the uh, text file from the spice simulation. And then it uh, does the parsing only once. Transfer function looked great, uh, no problem at all, but we used a fair amount of samples here, and we have a lot of frequency uh, points for our gain and phase. So a signal with all pre uh, frequencies present is the chirp, but we could also have used random noise. Random noise or white noise, non-colored noise, um, is a random signal having equal intensity at different frequencies if you have enough samples, uh, giving a constant power spectral density. But if I do that, you will notice that at the high frequencies, we start seeing some, some very strange spikes. 
Um, it looks like the underlying curvature is there. This is actually the uncalibrated one. So on the face side, it ends a little bit high. But uh, yeah, I, I know that my measurement is approximately right. What I could do is I could filter it a little bit. And if I filter that curve with a lot of measurement points, I actually end up having this. So even when I input noise, no specific frequency content, no sine wave at all, still the transfer function comes out. But I need to apply a filter. I needed to apply this filter because my data result was noisy. The problem is, I'm not sure why I'm doing this. Um, I could have uh, uh, run, for example, with only 50,000 samples um, with noisy data. Look at the result, and I might end up seeing the artifacts of my low pass filter on the data. If you filter something, that filter needs time to settle, and that's more pronounced on the low frequency part where there are just lesser data points in your transfer uh, uh, function. So I started with random noise, but I come back to it. This might not be the way to go. I need better random noise. There is a different VI called periodic random noise, which is the summation of sinusoidal signals with the same amplitude, but with random phase. And it consists of all the sine waves with integral number of cycles in your requested number of samples. And therefore, and therefore you need no window. That means if I simply replace the normal Gaussian distribution or white noise random noise generator with a specific one i don't need any filter i get the perfect uh, result and it looks like a chirp and in this way the frequency content of a chirp and of a, a periodic random noise generator are actually equivalent in this case your measurement time is about uh, 0.1 second so all the results look good we are ready to go could we have done better on the gain accuracy the phase accuracy the time how do we actually move from here? Um, we could make a faster chirp, we could uh, change the noise or choose a different method. Well, if we look from a power perspective on the frequency uh, domain, um, this is the chirp. The chirp get a flat frequency response up to some frequency, which we will set as F2. If we take the PRN, it's again a flat line. It's slightly differently scaled, but it's still a flat line. So flat energy for all frequencies. That's why chirp and PRN noise perform that well. My serial test frequencies, one sign after the other, has the diminishing uh, output uh, uh, level at higher frequencies. And if we do that for parallel, you get all those spikes, but we have problems with finding the right ones. That gives me a slight advantage going for chirp and PRN noise right now. But we could also have looked at the time aspect of it. If I present a pulse on the input, in this case, a square pulse, I can observe the reaction of my amplifier. And that's effectively good enough. What I can do is I can do system identification. I just provide a stimulus, I measure the response, I present the system to a model which says there are one pole, one zero, or two poles, two zeros, and it will figure out what the most likely transfer function is. And if you do that, well, this is your transfer function. Uh, that clearly shows that there is one zero and one pole uh, uh, linked to the, uh, the value of the resistors and, uh, and the capacitor. And that means that if you put it into one zero, one pole, this is the curve which comes out. And this is the result which comes out only after applying, in this case, I've done five pulses and I've done that for 10 milliseconds of time. So a very fast response, uh, a very fast stimulus, a very fast response, and the result is very, very accurate. Measurement time, 10 milliseconds. Also means that we can now describe the curve of the transfer gain plot and the transfer phase plot by a couple of numbers. We just need to store three or four numbers. And then we have uh, 
everything we need to reproduce. So result of identification with two poles and two zeros, well, that, that actually maps even better. Um, so maybe the op amp has a, a slightly dominant pole at a higher frequency because of its gain, uh, gain bandwidth product. So it's decision time. This is the most important one. Now, how do you rank your solution? Um, how much time does it cost to compute the result? Uh, do you need a license for it? What's the implied accuracy? What's the speed? Um, what's the flexibility? Will it adapt to different transfer functions? Uh, how do you know if it is the, the, the best one? Is it a generic solution? And how robust is it to noise? This is what our job as engineers is. We have a set of viable options. Now we need to choose. And choosing is always hard. So there are some pitfalls for engineers. And one of them is spending too much time in the research phase because we could make modifications to modifications and try to optimize the hell out of it. Um, Sometimes good enough is good enough. Getting stuck in the perfectionism trap and mistaking your option as fixed and binary. That means you don't need to choose one over the other. You can mix, mix and match. Uh, you are creative. You know what to do best. For example, if you don't want to measure the transfer function, but just grade the amplifier to be OK or not OK, uh, the gain was set by the ratio of two resistors. The gain transition, the frequency dependent behavior, was linked to the resistors and the value of capacitor C1. You know that this type of amplifier has always a minimum gain of one guaranteed by the design. And actually it has a low number of degrees of freedom. So why not do one frequency and a little bit of DC? If I just make my test a DC level plus one frequency in the transition in the uh, in the Bode plot. This is my result. I now have one data point at the low side. I have one data point during the transition that's also there in the face. And if I make only those two measurements, which I can do, for example, every 2.5 milliseconds, I check the DC gain and I check the gain in the face at two kilohertz and therefore conclude that the rest of that whole curve actually is as expected. Low number of the degrees of freedom means if you measure only a couple of points, that would be good enough. But that's only seeded by looking at the original question, which says measure the transfer function, the gain in the face, in order to grade the amplifier to be OK or not OK. Well, if I do this short measurement, I can guarantee you that that amplifier is doing OK. There is no way that it would misbehave with that limited amount of uh, freedom the design gives me. So design is a complex iterative process. Um, your initial design solution will likely be suboptimal or even wrong. Sometimes you go one step forward, two steps back due to new insight. I started with noise and that uh, I, I added a filter for it and then came to the conclusion that no, this is not the way to go. I need to change my noise shape. Ask more questions in any conversation. The process of coming up with questions to ask and listening to people's answer can lead to new ideas and insight. Yeah, failure is key to success. So uh, learn from your mistakes, but sometimes at a cost. Last final slides, and those are only a couple of slides. That means we have looked at the acquisition part. We collected our data. We looked at the frequency content. We know that the frequency content is identical to the time content. So if I look at the time signal over here, it looks like a very long sine wave. Still, if I convert it to my power spectrum, to my FFT, my frequency domain, it looks like nothing I would have guessed because I would have expected one single line at one frequency, but it's actually, uh, well, a whole lot. And there is nothing with a filter or a window I can do to make this change. So what's happening? Um, why is my sine wave not perfect anymore? It's because if you look at time, uh, your, your time domain signal, you know the value over time. That whole block of data, we can convert to frequency domain. And now we know which frequency components actually have energy. So what are the underlying collection of sine waves? In time, we don't know the frequency part. In a power spectrum, we don't know the time part. 
And in this example, they actually collide. And that means we need to go beyond the FFT. And for example, we can go for joint time frequency analysis. If we do that, JTFA, that same signal which we uh, saw a couple of slides earlier, now clearly shows us the following plots. We see that the frequency is changing between a high and a low frequency in time. So it's modulated, it's moving around. And because it is modulated, we actually get the bandwidth of modulation. So this is a normal modulated or FSK, frequency shift keyed modulation spectrum. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the shift in frequency is actually not even uh, uh, that nice. It's abrupt. Therefore, we consume a high bandwidth. If you couldn't look at your time signal like this, you wouldn't have guessed what it meant. Because if you now measure the AC signal by just finding the highest peak in the power domain, um, did you actually estimate the power of the signal or is a lot of that energy being moved to the sidebands, the upper and the lower sideband of your modulated signal? So analysis beyond FFT, yes, there is much more. JTFA, wavelet transformations, um, they gave you more insight. And the better you know your signal, the way better it becomes uh, to analyze correctly and estimate the values. So the full example is, it's just creating two sine waves of slightly different uh, uh, number of cycles in a, in a block. Therefore, if you know that it exists, you can see that the frequency over here is slightly higher than over there. Well, that's hindsight. Um, we calculate the FFT, which gives rubbish. We, give the, uh, we calculate the JTFA, and that shows us all the data insight we need. How do you know about this? Well, go to the LabVIEW Advanced Signal Processing Toolkit. Look at the examples provided. You need to buy this one, obviously, or buy a book, Joint Time Frequency Analysis. Uh, its book is heavy on the math. But uh, yeah, such a great introduction to joint time frequency analysis. Engineering. Last tip, theory versus practice. In theory, there is no difference between the two of them. But in practice, there are, there is. You will always find that it is slightly different um, uh, when you, when you uh, operate it. And you might not hit the, 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 the perfect measurement resolution. Uh, you need to try it a little bit, twiddle a little bit. and yeah, then there is always Murphy's law. So all problems can be solved. Um, you need to apply also the practical part to the theory to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Try to learn from your signal. Uh, see actually what's what's going on beneath the signal. Just don't don't calculate an average and be happy with it. Try to do a little bit more. That means, in summary, if you acquire your signal, check the quality. Always good advice. Know your signal. Analyze it until you understand it. If you don't understand your signal, you actually don't know what your measurement actually is doing. The right strategy to solve your need. Use the right strategy. You might be tempted to do something else, which under certain circumstances might be suboptimal. If you use statistics, please use the statistics properly. Do not assume, but verify if you have the time. Read the manual. It's really there for you to uh, gain a lot of knowledge and have fun in the process because this is the engineering cycle. You try something out, you learn from it, you make an improvement, and you're all the better off for it. So if you have questions, well, you need to first formulate the right type of questions. <laughs> use the power of many, so internet forums, user groups, uh, get in contact with your company experts in a different field. Maybe some of the slides were heavy on the electronics. Well. Contact the guy who, uh, who has all the knowledge on electronics and ask him, can you help me? Because I might not be doing it in the best possible way. Uh, take a course and learn from the experts or buy yourself a book and start reading. Uh, that's why books are there. And that finally, at slide 139, uh, that, that means I have done my job. I've run through all the slides which I wanted to present. Thank you very much for your patience and attendance, of course. And uh, yeah, in a, in a little bit of time, we can actually start to the main course of this uh, uh, Let You Use a Group, uh, Jeff K's talk, of course. Uh, I was just the appetizer, the entree. Uh, 
call me the starter. Somebody needs to start. It was me. You are saying that, Martin, but uh, when I read the chat, they really appreciate the uh, in-depth uh, presentation you just uh, have given. So thank you very much. We have one question uh, from Femke. I yes. think you already answered it in an earlier slide. But the question is, um, what are good resources to study for designing a multi-channel doc data acquisition? I would first start. Uh, so thanks first for the question, of course. Um, but I would uh, um, first identify if you have a need for a multi-channel, non-simultaneously sampled uh, signal, or is it simultaneously sampled? That's the first decision. Do they need to be at the same time, or can they be spaced a little bit apart in time? Because one solution is far cheaper than the other one. So multiplex is far cheaper than simultaneous. The second one is, all right, uh, go to one of the boards from the national side, because that integrates nicely, of course, with the DocMX driver, which saves you a lot of trouble uh, getting it to work. Uh, some of the boards from national are, might not be the cheapest, but the combination always uh, is, uh, is, is, is relatively uh, optimal. Uh, you get good hardware, great support, and a driver which really works. Read the manual. Read the manual to see, can I connect my uh, live signals in the right way? The next step would be uh, the introductionary talks about um, doing measurements with DocMX for analog input voltages or currents. Do you need a filter? Um, there are not that many books which go heavy on the detail for data acquisition. I found a book a long time ago which does a fair job in explaining it, but it is not seeded uh, with the DocMX, but that comes from the, the previous Doc driver, the traditional Doc driver. And let me get it for you. Um, it's an old one. I think it's more than 20 years old, but it was called uh, Lab View Applications and Solutions by uh, uh, Mr. Jamal and uh, Bislik, if I pronounce it correctly. And uh, that actually explains quite a lot about uh, the bigger things, uh, also a bit on the analysis part. I think there are also some good uh, uh, manuals to be found on the national website about uh, doing measurements or signal uh, type of analysis which go one step further and they probably address acquiring the data uh, in one of the the, the entry uh, the, the starter uh, chapters okay so if you need more data just contact me directly and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll help you in the right direction yeah, we uh, will put all the slides in the description of this YouTube channel. We also have um, uh, the Dutluk website and the Dutluk uh, community thread, which is on an iForum. Uh, yes. You will find the slides there uh, in a few hours, days, uh, but they will be posted online. Martin, okay. thank you very much for all your work, for your volunteering. No problem and, at all. Um, we will now uh, take a little break and uh, we will be back in a few moments. Thank you very all much, right. everyone.
So, and I think we are online again. Welcome everyone in the stream, in the chat. Welcome, uh, Mr. Godowski. Very nice that you could join us. Uh, we have a very special guest. Um, he's the co-founder from NI. He's the actual inventor of LabVIEW. Um, so he's using LabVIEW since uh, 1986, since LabVIEW uh, 1.0. And um, yeah, Jeff, hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, good to hear that, good to hear that, yes. It's being at home <laughs> and, uh, and doing well, thanks. Yes, and you're going to update us on the target uh, structure and uh, the channels. Um, you did a, a first presentation, uh, I think a year ago or two years ago during the CLA summit. So um, yeah, I'll uh, get into that in a moment if I uh, should start now. Sure. Please start. <laughs> uh, at, just um, have to mention that you know it's it's really strange to be physically isolating during this global pandemic, but using technology to communicate and interact at an unprecedented level. Um, you know, in normal times, I probably wouldn't be able to visit and present at your meeting, but in today's world, distance doesn't matter. In fact, you know, I think we have a unique opportunity to bring the global labview community together as never before. Uh, so I'm particularly thankful to the Dutch Lab user group for inviting me to present today, and I hope this will inspire a new level of collaboration among user groups worldwide. So uh, I thought today that I'd give you an update on uh, the research that I've been uh, doing on, in the past several years on targets and, and channels. So um, let's see. Don't see. I'm not able to, yeah, okay, there we go. So, um, you know, my primary focus uh, is on what LabVIEW was uniquely positioned to do to advance the state of the art in systems design. Measurement systems are designed today, at, that are designed today are actually distributed. We have a host PC, LabVIEW RT, LabVIEW FPJ, and the, the future trend is toward even more distribution. We'll have cloud computation, storage, web and mobile UIs, and IoT, and so on. And my view is that distributed systems should be designed and visualized using graphics, because that makes relationships and communications visible and understandable. Now, the tools that we use to build distributed measurement systems add artificial complexity to the inherent complexity of the ap application we're trying to build. And I think the way to uh, rein in this artificial complexity is by using abstraction. And uh, what I like to think of is semantic zooming, where you zoom in to see details and zoom out to see the big picture. And if you can do that while you're developing, I think that will foster more modularity in our designs and result in more maintainable and extensible systems. So let me start with um, talking about uh, channels. Now, channels, I, I believe, are an, a major advance in the representational capability of LabVIEW. Ever since LabVIEW 1, I've been frustrated by how to represent the communication between concurrently running loops. A decade ago, I began to experiment with a promising approach that was eventually productized as channels in LabVIEW 2016. So it's been out for quite a while already. Channels are very helpful today, but they'll be even more helpful when we can represent distributed concurrent loops. I've described channels multiple times before, so I'm just going to summarize with a simple example. So uh, a channel has a distinctive pipe-like wire pattern, and the lack of visible tunnels at the structure borders uh, indicate that it's a a channel rather than a regular wire, and a channel actually implies concurrency rather than scheduling dependence. So people who are familiar with LabVIEW have to learn that this other kind of wire is not a, a normal LabVIEW dependency wire, but it is a data flow wire. It's flowing data uh, through the pipe from one loop to another. Um, so the Channel endpoints in the diagram here, I'm going to, yeah, if you can see my mouse, 
Here's the right endpoint. Here's the read endpoint for this channel. And the endpoints are just sub DI calls for writing and reading uh, values to and from the channel. There are multiple kinds of channels for different communication strategies. The, the most common are stream, uh, which is like a point to point FIFO uh, or Q, uh, tag, which is similar to a, a constrained global, and messenger which has aspects of both. You can have multiple readers and writers. It has Q-like uh, uh, semantics. All of these channels are strongly typed, just like regular labby wires. And you don't drop a channel endpoint from a uh, pallet. You create it from by popping up on a terminal. And uh, so um, you can find out a lot more about channels by taking a look at the examples in the example folder. They, they show um, different uh, use cases, different examples for different styles of channels, as well as design patterns, such as the channel message handler pattern, which I modeled on the cube message handler. And, and that's what I'm illustrating at the bottom of the slide here. Um, there's a UI loop over here with an event structure and it uh, sends commands along the messenger channel to the message handling loop. And this loop processes the, the uh, messages and does whatever actions it's gonna do, DAC, DAC acquisitions and whatnot, um, and sends status information back to a display loop, which is part of the UI. So this is, this is a pattern that I, I think uh, is, is pretty universal and it's kind of what the queued message handler was doing. I'm doing it with, uh, uh, channels in this case, and I think it uh, might be a little bit easier to uh, see what's actually going on. One interesting thing that uh, I want to point out um, is that uh, some channels have a sideband communication. This input here to the stream right uh, endpoint tells us it is used to tell the, the stream that this is the last value that's being queued. And that can be used to stop this loop. So the, the sideband communication allows synchronized uh, communication from uh, writer to reader such that uh, you don't have race conditions when you're trying to start up or shut down uh, operations. And, and I think that's uh, something that can get uh, tricky if, if um, you're trying to implement this at a lower level yourself. Um, but one of the biggest advantages of uh, channels is that you can actually put a probe on the channel. And when you put a probe on there, you can see all the data that's in the channel. And you also have the ability to single step, meaning that you can advance to the next read or write operation on the channel and, and halt execution at that point to inspect what's there. So I think the debugging possibilities uh, uh, with, with channels uh, will make uh, application development so much easier and faster. Um, so uh, my recommendation is that if you find uh, yourself building an application with concurrent loops, use channels and simplify your life. So uh, one other quick example um, uh, is, uh, this is also in the um, example folder, stream processing, uh, similar to what you might do with Unix pipes. So all of these VIs are running concurrently and they're transferring data um, across streams. So here's one stream of strings, here's another stream of strings, another and so on. And the first VI opens up a file, reads it out line at a time and produces a stream of uh, strings, uh, one per line. The second one filters that those strings, uh, that stream of strings, and passes through only the ones that satisfy a certain pattern. So this is like grep on the Unix command line. Um, this one reads in uh, a, a stream of strings and breaks each string up into uh, individual words. So it writes out uh, many more uh, strings on the output than it reads on the input, basically the number of words per line and so on. So the, the, the main point uh, of this is that um, 
if you have a, uh, a collection of these stream processing uh, VIs, you can string them together and, and uh, pretty easily construct uh, a variety of stream processing applications. You know, similar to the way, in this case, the way we would do uh, pipes on a Unix command line. Okay, so uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the target structure. This is, um, you know, if, if channels can simplify the representation communicating between concurrent loops, concurrent actors, uh, today running on the same machine, but what if you want these actors running on different machines? So that's where this target structure uh, abstraction comes in. So this is um, still a research experiment. Uh, so don't take uh, the, the UI uh, or the, the graphics here too literally. It's, it's still uh, uh, early stages of experimentation. But the idea is that this is going to allow the representation of distributed applications using a single canvas. So what do we do today to send data from a loop on RT to a loop on the FPGA? We have to create two VIs, one on uh, each uh, device, using three windows, uh, add project window here, allocating a special resource to do the communication and so on. But uh, in, in the vision of the target structure, we'll be able to do this all in one diagram, a single canvas with a simple visible connection. I have a channel that spans from my uh, host or my RT diagram to my FPGA diagram. Uh, and it ought to be this simple to construct. So uh, at the syntactic level, uh, the target structure is similar to other structures in lab. However, the diagram inside the target structure is compiled for, deployed to, and run on a different machine, in this case, the FPGA. So uh, what kind of challenges do we have in trying to make the target structure uh, reality? Um, at, at the high level, the concept seems simple enough, but there are these challenges. For, for one thing, uh, compiling and deploying, uh, we actually know how to do that. Project Tree does that. Uh, but can we um, do that automatically behind the scenes? And uh, so, in fact, a, a lot of the experimentation we're doing is using the project tree, but trying to uh, keep it in the background and uh, automate the construction and uh, navigation pro project tree. Um, a, a channel that crosses a, t uh, a target boundary needs to use some kind of hardware. Um, the hardware and resources and driver interfaces exist. We have a, 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 a myriad uh, of, of ways to do that, and uh, they're all available in the project tree again. But it, but can we automate and orchestrate this automatically so that um, it, it's not something where the user has to do with all the details and, and get all of that uh, correct? Um, so another question we have is, is it, is it useful to have a target structure within another um, structure in LabVIEW inside of a loop or a case or a sub VI or inside another target structure? And what would it mean? Actually, uh, the, the first uh, three of these bullet points here, we've been experimenting with and prototyping and uh, we've got some um, uh, good proofs of concept, and I think we're pretty confident that uh, uh, we can make this work and, and work well. That obviously, it'd be a lot of work to uh, get it productized, but uh, we're pretty confident that we could do that. Um, the last two were still uh, uh, very much in the research stage. Uh, how, how could we represent disconnecting and reconnecting to uh, a remote target? And, how would we implement uh, debugging and probing, single stepping, and so on? Uh, so those are still uh, early stage research topics. So um, one of the folks on, on our team, Newton Peterson, has been fo focusing on the FPGA cases. He's been experimenting with Elvis 3 and CREO and PXI 
and he's prototyped target crossing channels that use DMA FIFOs and FPGA registers. And uh, his approach is to script the project tree to leverage its functionality, but to hide the complexity. And that seems like a really uh, good strategy for us to follow. Uh, for the time being, there's a pop-up on the target structure to compile it, since uh, it takes a while for the FPGA to compile. Hitting the run button starts the host application, which deploys the FPGA, FPGA bit file, starts it, and also coordinates the establishment of the communication channel between uh, the uh, host and the uh, target. Um, so uh, I've been focusing, on the other hand, uh, on looking at the network CPU case. And so uh, I'm gonna illustrate that with this um, uh, little example that I created. Um, that's a simple stream processing uh, example again, where the loop on the left here generates a, a letter each two seconds. And then the first loop appends a phrase, second loop appends another phrase, third loop displays the result. Um, and what I want to do is um, have this distributed. So uh, this, uh, I'm going to show you a video here uh, of a screen capture on my iMac. So the background window here is actually showing a uh, Windows virtual machine running in the Amazon cloud that I've remote desktop into from my Mac. And in the foreground is a VI that's running on my uh, iMac. And I'm going to introduce uh, target structures in here to distribute the execution of this. So we'll see if the video plays. Okay. So first thing I want to do is uh, drop a target structure around the second loop and give it the address of a different iMac that I have uh, sitting next to the first one. And then I'm gonna select this update instance uh, in order to get the code ready to deploy. That should be automatic in the future. Uh, I'm also gonna put a target structure around the second loop and give it the IP address uh, of the virtual machine up here. And so uh, again, update uh, that to make it ready to go. Now when I start it running, um, I'm going to end up deploying the VIs so that they can be run. You can see it start running on the uh, virtual machine in the background. And then the uh, display starts catching up because while it was starting up, there was data being enqueued in the uh, in this um, uh, stream over here. And then when this uh, started up and this started up, it was able to process and the display, since it's displaying every one second, it will catch up. So uh, the uh, uh, other interesting thing is I'm able to hit the stop button over here and that propagates through and stops my distributed pieces as well as my display loop. So it all behaves uh, as expected. So um, the, uh, the point is that if we can um, uh, get this target structure operational, it ought to make distributed applications much simpler to create. And in fact, in this case, I had uh, parts running on my Macintosh and parts running on uh, Windows machine, and uh, uh, it all behaved just properly. Okay, so here's another example that I've been uh, that I've played with um, to see uh, what it means to have a target structure inside of the LabVIEW structures. So um, here I've got a, a parallel for loop that uh, creates two instances of two instances of my acquire analyze present example. So I have a acquire loop, a present presentation loop, and a an analyze loop that's in the sub-di. 
So each sub DI contains um, an instance of a loop running on a target. And uh, the channels in and out are, are two sets of IP, uh, TCP IP connections uh, that allow me to connect from uh, my host computer to my other computer. And uh, I, I've actually got both uh, instances running on the same processor as two independent instances running on the same processor. Uh, but I could actually distribute them to different CPUs by wiring the in the target address as opposed to specifying it statically. Uh, but I don't have one machine to show it. Okay, uh, so uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, channels are already here and you should be using them uh, and that target structures are still in research but hold great promise for reducing the artificial complexity of building distributed applications. And I think the combination will enable you to be more effective building even more complex applications in the future. Uh, I should also point out that um, I'm using G to uh, do this development and experimentation because of its flexibility and the rapid development I can do with it. A channel is defined by a library of VIs. So it makes it easier and faster to develop, easier to bug, and it's extensible by us as well as by knowledgeable alliance members. Um, you can find the, um, uh, all the channels that are available on your system in resource channels folder. Uh, so far, um, we've similarly been able to define the target behavior or most of the target behavior in terms of uh, a library of VIs. And, and my long-term goal is to make targeting a user extensible feature so that you can create the VIs that define how to support new targets. Um, so now I want to switch gears and talk about another channel that I've been working on that uh, offers some interesting possibilities for um, representing um, more complex applications. So I, I was inspired uh, by an application that one of our alliance members made that uh, he, he was using channels, but uh, it was more, it, it was trickier than, than I expected. And um, looking at his uh, particular application, it, it struck me that uh, I could uh, perhaps define a more, uh, a more complex channel that would make his application simpler. So I've been experimenting with this multiplexed messenger channel and it actually represents multiple messenger subchannels on a single wire. So it has the usual read and write endpoints uh, with uh, all the full complement of um, uh, optional inputs and outputs. Uh, but what makes this channel uh, particularly special is the subchannel index. So different writers and readers can dynamically choose which subchannel they wish to communicate on. And uh, where, where might this be useful? So here's an example, simple example I built. Uh, I call it a manager minion example. There's a manager VI that controls eight concurrent station VIs. And you'll pardon my primitive uh, UI here on the main uh, uh, VI, but uh, that's not the point of the example. So imagine a much nicer UI, if you will. So the LEDs here are showing the status of each station, whether it's off or active, pause, error, or it's finished, it's exited. Um, the operator can select a channel with um, one of the buttons up here, then select a command with this pull down and then hit this button to send the command. So what does this look like? Well, the diagram has the usual um, uh, familiar UI event loop, uh, event structure and an event loop here, and then uh, a status display over here 
back on the, on the host. And then these um, parallel stations. And here I'm running eight stations in parallel. Um, so uh, the connection from the host to the stations is using a multiplex messenger channel. And that allows the, the manager here to talk specifically to a particular station. And that station, uh, each of these parallel instances is given its unique station ID. Uh, and the uh, uh, results or the responses from the stations are all merged back into a single messenger channel. But as part of the message coming back is a station index, uh, index. And so that allows the display loop to know which stations reply that was. Uh, yeah, okay, I just said that, sorry. So here's um, a, uh, the code for the station uh, VI and uh, I don't worry too much about the code. Uh, I, I designed this using the state diagram editor and I just pasted a picture of the state diagram so you can understand uh, the different states of the, uh, that the station goes through. Um, so basically I continue processing, uh, doing 10 millisecond incremental processing while I'm in the active state and then uh, I uh, exit the active state if I see an error or if I'm told to pause uh, or told to stop or told to exit. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, so the, the main thing to notice here is that the uh, station is reading from its assigned sub channel on this messenger channel, multiplex messenger channel. And it's using the uh, station number uh, in its reply message back so that the uh, manager can see who it came from. Uh, so here's another uh, video that uh, shows this um, in operation. I start it running and it starts up all uh, eight parallel stations. And then I can, uh, you know, start station seven and two and six and zero. And I'll go back and pause uh, station two. And I can stop station zero. And, uh, and then I can go over to exit seven and say, uh, I need to exit that one because uh, that station is broken or uh, not being used. I can, pick some other ones to start, uh, five and four. I go back and um, I can resume station two and you can see that it goes back to processing. Uh, station six detects an error and I can go back and reset it and start it again. Um, and uh, pause uh, and finally just exit all stations and the example. So the um, uh, uh, takeaway here is that with that single multiplex messenger channel, I can very conveniently talk to a bunch of parallel stations. Eventually, of course, it'd be wonderful if I could have a target structure in each one of those stations and uh, be uh, having them deployed to individual machines. That's Still in the works. <clears throat> okay, so uh, while I was experimenting with this multiplex messenger channel, um, I realized I could use it to model a bi-directional channel. Um, and, and so I, I was thinking initially, I could uh, imagine a policy where the manager would send a message to a minion on channel 2N and receive a reply on channel 2N plus one. And I mean, a policy like that could work, but um, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, it seems like it'd be impossible to enforce and error prone if someone accidentally wrote on the wrong subchannel. And so um, I, I 
realized I could actually make it simpler and more secure by adding two more pairs of otherwise identical endpoints. So one set is used for the manager to send commands and the other for the minion to send replies. Instead of using indices, this pair of subchannels, one in each direction, is identified by a grid. So how might this be useful? So here's an application with a dynamic number of clients, a server, and a dynamic number of workers, one per client. So this example again has a, a trivial uh, UI uh, and uh, I'm just using this to, uh, to set it up. I can imagine a much more interesting in, uh, situation to the, uh, for this to be working. But um, in, in this example, I have a button. Every time I hit a button, it creates a client. And the client sends a message to the server. The server spins up a worker, which then communicates with the client. And the two of them uh, communicate privately until I finish. So um, here's the diagram. The <clears throat> client, uh, every time I hit the new button, I spin up a new client, which sends a message to the server. And the server then spins up a worker, an asynchronous worker, and the worker and the client communicate on their private channel, private bidirectional channel that is um, uh, defined by this grid. So the uh, client initiates uh, uh, the request for service by sending its grid to the server and the server uh, launches a worker and uh, then provides this bi-directional uh, secure channel between the client and the worker. So um, here's the UIs that you'll see in my next example in, uh, showing this. The client has a simple UI again, and um, uh, I could imagine, uh, and it's got buttons on here that that I'm controlling interactively, but I would imagine this is done automatically and programmatically uh, in a real application. Um, the, uh, um, well, okay, so the, the worker, uh, nothing to say about that. The worker uh, uh, UI is basically just for debugging purposes, but you, you can see it in the example. So, here, when I start this example, if I um, launch a new client, the server spawns a new worker and the worker and the client communicate and I can um, control uh, the different clients and see uh, how they're communicating with their workers and when a failure is reported on one client, I, I can uh, still spawn other clients. I can exit clients, whether they succeeded or failed. Um, and when the client exits, it sends an exit message to the worker, which exits and the client exits. Um, and all the while I can be um, operating the uh, clients independently and uh, they're communicating with their workers. And it's all happening all represented on this uh, single uh, multiplex messenger channel. To take a look at the code, again, you don't have to worry about the details, but notice that the client is very similar to the typical uh, event loop and uh, event structure and a UI loop and a display structure. It's just that the commands are going out and the responses are coming back on the same uh, bi-directional channel. And um, so it, it's a similar pattern, uh, but maybe being uh, able to be represented a little bit more compactly by having a uh, single bi-directional channel. So the, that channel is identified by uh, a private grid, 
per client. And so this grid is sent to the server. Uh, and when it's sent to the server, then this channel becomes active using that grid uh, to uh, receive a response or send a command. And here's the worker diagram. Again, it's similar to the processing loop that we've seen before in the other examples. Uh, again, never mind the details. Um, but uh, notice that the uh, command is being received on uh, the channel that uh, is specified by the GUID that the worker was given when it was started. The server gave the GUID to the worker. And the worker is using that GUID to receive commands, and it's also using that to send responses. Uh, in this case, it's sending status responses. Uh, uh, continually uh, until um, it uh, finishes and then is told to exit. Uh, so let me finish up with uh, one uh, item that's just kind of pure fantasy at this point. Uh, this design pattern up here is um, is a way a compact way to show uh, multiple asynchronous clients talking to multiple asynchronous workers. And um, that's, uh, I, I think it's a useful abstraction, but it doesn't um, show enough of the dynamic behavior in the diagram. And so I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to hallucinate what a, uh, a good way to represent a dynamic diagram that can show uh, the connections as they come and go. So in, in a sense, this design pattern up here is a generator of a dynamic diagram. So uh, this is a little um, uh, kind of a, uh, a vision of what an executing uh, or execution highlighting of a dynamic diagram might look like uh, uh, at least at this stage of my thinking. In the beginning, you, you have the server and it's sitting there idle. Along comes the client, messages the server, gets a worker, communicates with the worker. Another client comes along, third client comes along, and, uh, and that third worker is set up with its communication channel. Uh, second worker uh, finishes, uh, first worker uh, finishes, the client goes away, and then finally the uh, last one finishes and we're back to it. Uh, idle situation with the server sitting there waiting for a client to come along. So, uh, you know, is something like this possible? I have no idea, but uh, it seems like that's the kind of thing you'd like to have available uh, while you're debugging or watching your uh, dynamic system execute. So I presented a lot here uh, very quickly, um, but uh, I think the main points you should take away are that um, channels today can simplify your life if you're making concurrent applications, so please use them. And uh, stay tuned for more progress on target structures. Uh, I think uh, they will hold out um, a lot of promise for simplifying things in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> so hello, thank you, Jeff. Um, that was an amazing presentation. Uh, it gives a good insight in the future uh, features that will be um, shipped with LabVIEW, and I'm really excited. Um, so we have a few questions uh, in, in chat, and the first obvious one is, uh, of course, when will this be shipped? When, when can we play with it? When can we start developing with it? <laughs> um, yeah, that's always a, a tough question. Um, so uh, the, the last thing I talked about, the messenger channel, um, actually, uh, I have it. It's just a library of VIs. I can zip it up and send it out to anybody who's interested in it. Um, it it's probably um, uh, uh, workable and usable today, uh, but it, it's the kind of thing that uh, I'd love to have more feedback on to uh, make sure that uh, I, I get it all uh working smoothly before it's actually an official part of the product. Mm -hmm. 
So, well, so maybe you can send uh, it to us, and we post it here on the on the YouTube video and the forum, so people can download it and uh, maybe give you feedback from. Yeah, okay. uh, that'd be great. Um, as far as the target structure goes, uh, we continue to experiment, and um, I guess I'm of the opinion that we're getting pretty close to having sort of the first tranche of usable capability that would help in, um, so in, in many of the more static applications, uh, say um, host uh, and RT or host and um, uh, Raspberry Pi or host and uh, RT, maybe RT and FPGA. FPGA yeah. uh, the, the, the ones with the FPGA are a little bit trickier, obviously, and, and have a little bit more machinery that has to be uh, really vetted out. And so, uh, but may, maybe the, 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 the version for doing uh, between processors, uh, like to RT and to uh, Raspberry Pi and so on, is something that we could get out in experimental form um, sooner rather than later. Because mm -hmm. again, uh, you know, I feel like uh, I could try to um, evolve things more uh, myself with experimenting, uh, but I'm not going to run into the same kinds of things that people doing real applications are going to run into. And so uh, if there are a few brave souls who are willing to uh, uh, help me experiment with some of this, um, that might be something we could do before too long. Sounds good, sounds good, yes. Um, another question that we have is, uh, what possibilities will there be for getting target structures to communicate with other already running on the target? This with uh, other target structures already running on the target. So um, this is something I haven't done a lot of thinking about yet, but um, uh, in, in the examples, you notice that the way we communicate between one processor and a target is through channels. And so um, we can send a stream of data or uh, a tag across it. And, and so to the extent that we could have an interface on the target written in another language or another system that could do the protocol necessary for uh, uh, communicating over a stream or a, a tag or something, then it ought to work just fine. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of gotchas and is, uh, uh, will probably end up with uh, a lot of different uh, little issues to uh, address. So uh, uh, I, in the future, I, I mean, I think this is something we obviously want to do, but uh, it's not where our primary focus is uh, off the bat. At the moment, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 of course. So I'm looking at, uh, at the people who are monitoring the chat, the chat. There are no more questions at the moment. So if somebody has a question, please uh, ask it now. Now is the time. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I realize a lot of the stuff I was going through, I went through really fast. Um, and uh, a lot of it might be quite new to folks. So. Uh, Yes, yeah. some, some people will see that the first time. And, yeah. and the hard thing that I have is um, it lets a little bit loose from um, the data flow uh, that you know from LabVIEW. So some block diagrams are really are hard to um, comprehend at first sight because you are not, a, um, yeah, you, you do not look at block diagrams that way yet. So it's, it's a, a little, yeah. little bit practice, yeah. Yes, that, that's very, uh, very good observation. In fact, um, we did uh, an experiment a couple of years ago in um, uh, Yerevan, Armenia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we took some students who were just learning LabVIEW and we taught them about channels in the LabVIEW 1 class. And they got it, they understood it, they were able to develop their uh, uh, little example applications, just fine, no problem. Mm -hmm. We also took a group of uh, third year uh, college students who uh, had already been using LabVIEW for two years and uh, taught them about channels. 
And they actually took a little longer to understand because they had internalized the, um, the notion that if you connect something with a wire on LabVIEW, it means the data is flowing and that the second node is dependent on the first node finishing before it can start. Yes. And that's true for the regular LabVIEW wires, but the channel wire, which we purposely draw differently, although maybe it's still a subtle enough difference that it takes a little bit of experience to get comfortable with it. Um, but that one actually means this is a pipe. It's still data flow and it's still by value, but it's happening uh, not after this first loop finishes, sending an array of data to the second loop. It's happening uh, a point at a time through this pipe. And uh, so um, it's doing something that we already do in our applications. We do this with a queue, a queue. right? You, you have a uh, allocated queue and then you pass the reference to the writer and the reader mm -hmm. and uh, this end queues, this D queues, and we have this magical uh, property of I, something I write over here appears over here. There's a flow of data, but you don't actually see it. So from, from my perspective, what we're doing with the uh, channel is actually showing the path of the data and showing that here's the reader, here's the writer, but you do have to learn that this channel connection is not the same as a regular LabVIEW wire connection. A LabVIEW wire implies scheduling dependency, yeah. whereas a channel wire implies concurrency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most, um, uh, the best benefit I see for uh, channel wires, or that I saw at channel wires while using them, is that when you get to use other, uh, other people's code, other programmers' code, and they're using named queues. It, it's not immediately clear where those queues are enqueued and dequeued. You have to basically uh, scan the whole uh, project library to find out if there are, and that's a problem. But with channels, you can follow to where um, the data is used, and that's, uh, that makes everything more um, visible, yeah. Yeah. and, and uh... That's exactly right. And that, to me, that's um, uh, one of the strengths of LabVIEW in that uh, you see where data is generated and where it's used. And um, in, in typical uh, text-based programming languages, you're using the name of a variable. And so to be sure that there isn't someplace else that that variable is being used or being reset or uh, whatever, uh, you, you have to scan your code or... Uh, uh, you know, so use some other tools, but if, if you have a wire representing the transfer of the data, you can tell at a glance, well, here's where it's being generated, here's where it's being consumed. So I think the same thing happens with the, a, a queue now. I can represent the queue with a wire and I can see the source and the sink, but I just have to remember that, okay, this wire means that, that things are flowing uh, at runtime between these two loops. And this other wire means that uh, first this loop finishes and then this one starts. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have another question. <clears throat> Would it be possible to configure target structures, pro target structures programmatically? So um, I can imagine that uh, you might want to script a target structure and script the address uh, of the target that you want so that you could um, uh, configure, automatically configure uh, a system based on some uh, information about the uh, targets that you have. And so so uh, we do have the ability to script a target structure. It's even more primitive than, than the target structure itself is, but uh, that, that's certainly being thought of. We want to be able to do that. Okay, that sounds good. <clears throat> but because I think a lot of plugin architectures will be very useful. Uh, uh, right. Users, yes. So I'm looking at the chat again. Are there some more questions, guys? Round up? No, there are no questions. Okay. That's bad. <laughs> well, um, if you get any in the future uh, and you want to forward them to me, uh, certainly know how to reach me by email, and I'll be happy to. Uh, 
answer any additional questions. And yes, yes. So for all the presentations, that's uh, if you send uh, an email to uh, Dotlog or post them on the uh, community thread, I will make sure that it is forwarded to the correct presenters and you will get an answer. Yes. Yes, and hopefully a lot of people will start um, experimenting with uh, with these structures and the channels and, and give you some feedback. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Jeff, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you. I think it's really appreciated. And um, hopefully the next time. All right. Stay okay. healthy. Bye-bye. Stay healthy. <laughs> yes. So everyone, we are going to uh, take a, a short coffee break and then we will continue with the last presentation. Thank you very much, everyone.
So welcome everyone. Welcome for the last presentation, which is uh, my presentation. Um, <clears throat> uh, so Tetris and FPGA, it's, uh, it's a hobby project of mine. Um, for the people that uh, do not know, I work uh, for VI Technologies. Um, I'm a CLA, CLED and uh, a LabVIEW champion. And um, I had a hobby. Oh, let me start at the beginning. Let me see the next uh, next slide. So first, that was on FPGA. What are we talking about? I have a video where um, I can display the game. So this is uh, actually uh, running on pure FPGA code. There is no code running on uh, a real-time target. This is uh, only FPGA code and using uh, digital uh, I/O. Um, this is running on a compact, nee, sorry, on a MyRio, which has no uh, display capabilities. So I'm generating the uh, Visa signal um, using uh, the digital outputs. Uh, what you see here is. Uh, a resolution of uh, 1600 times 1200 uh, at 59 hertz uh, frame rate and uh, eight colors. And uh, using uh, special techniques, I can get um, more colors than that or the illusion of more colors. If you look at the VR Technologies logo, uh, it seems like there are more colors, but we are using a technique here that is called dithering, uh, which basically puts um, pixels of different colors next to each other, which from a distance seem like uh, an, another color. The same you can see at the uh, the astronaut in the, in the game, um, which is uh, black and white. There's only two colors uh, that you can see there, but it has the illusion if it has, um, as if it has gray scales uh, uh, colors. So there are four players. Uh, the players are playing using uh, Atari joysticks. I will tell you more about that uh, later. And um, basically, it's, it's Tetris. So um, you get a random block. You can rotate it by pressing the joystick button. You can move the block left and right. And you can uh, hard drop it by uh, pressing the joystick off. Uh, the block will fall down, and um, the next block will, uh, will appear. Um, you get points for the number of lines you clear. Um, if you clear more lines uh, in one go, then you get more points. Uh, and the game speeds up uh, according to the number of lines uh, you are clearing. Um, yeah, and the game supports four players. Let me see. Yes, so the whole idea um, of this started with uh, a YouTube video that was um, released uh, last year uh, by Ben Eater. And he basically builds a video card using only uh, a breadboard, some ICs, uh, a crystal, and an EEPROM. He uses the EEPROM to store an image, uh, the crystal for um, the clock, and then uh, the whole ICs to generate the uh, VGA signal. And I saw that video and was uh, instantly inspired to uh, do that on FPGA. Um, if you want to see these videos, you can uh, Google Ben Eater, or you can look in the description of this uh, YouTube channel uh, where I posted uh, the, the link. Or, it, or Actually, it are, it are two videos, uh, two parts of it. Uh, so both uh, videos are linked here. And it's very, very interesting. He actually continues and builds uh, a whole computer, a whole CPU on a breadboard. Um, and this is just one module of it. But um, after seeing this, uh, I could instantly see how to uh, port this to an uh, to an left view FPGA. So this is the hardware that I'm uh, that I'm using. Um, you can find everything uh, online. Of course, the MyRio you can get from our favorite uh, hardware vendor. Uh, the Atari joystick and the terminal blocks um, are found in a lot of electronic uh, online stores and only cost a, a few bucks. And the, the terminal blocks make everything uh, a lot easier, uh, e also for debugging. If you start soldering, it's, uh, it's it just makes it harder. Um, the joysticks, so the, the CX40, are is actually uh, are actually five switches. So you have four directions, and you have the button. And if you push the joystick in one direction, you're actually closing uh, a switch. So um, to connect this to a digital input on your MyRio, you can use uh, this uh, um, diagram to uh, to basically, yeah, to basically connect it. And if you notice, there is no additional um, electronics uh, needed. You can directly connect 
each of the um, the joystick pins do the digital inputs and you have a direct uh, um, uh, input value for all of your five um, uh, directions and button of the of the joystick so this is um, uh, what it looks like um, my uh, colleague Kuntewe was uh, nice enough to uh, uh, 3D print us a, a case. So what you can see here are the four joystick connectors on the on the other side, and also here you, here you can see that there is no electronic between it. Um, and on the back side, um, we are using five digital outputs to create the uh, VGA or Visa signal. And it's not visible here, but they also directly connected to the terminal block. There is no um, extra electronics needed. And uh, yeah, we'll see that later. So the first game I built, uh, that was last year, is uh, a snake on FPJ. It's a snake game. Uh, some of you may have seen this uh, during NI days in uh, in Munich. Uh, I had a demo uh, um, where I showcased uh, this game. Again, this is uh, done the same way using uh, the same uh, VGA uh, technique. Um, but the requirements, no, the specifications of uh, this game are a little bit lower. I learned a lot implementing this. Um, and uh, from there out, I was challenged to do uh, the Tetris game. Um, you can get the uh, source code for this game uh, when you visit the VI Technologies website. So um, vitech.nl, uh, go to the blog and select uh, Snake on FPGA, and you will find uh, a link to GitHub where you can download uh, the, the source code. Um, but this presentation is about uh, Tetris. So first more uh, theory about how to generate uh, a VGA signal. It's actually relatively easy. Um, so as you can see on the VGA connector, you have um, five wires that will be directly connected to five digital ins of your choice. And uh, you need to connect a few pins uh, through your, uh, on your ground. Um, and then you have this uh, horizontal sync and uh, vertical sync line which uh, let me put on the pointer uh, yes so you have this uh, horizontal uh, sync and vertical sync line so what is actually happening is with all uh, crt tvs and monitors you have uh, a raster line or a scan line so basically um, you are drawing line by line from left to right and uh, once the uh, line is uh, at the last point of the visible uh, area this this uh, rectangle here, the electron beam will start um, going back to the first pixel of the second line. And the time needed needed to make that this, make this transition is what you see here. Um, LCD monitors do not uh, theoretically need this, but to uh, have backwards compatibility, they um, expect a signal which is uh, the same for VGA and CRT monitors. Um, so they, they will function. So basically what you need to do is get the timing right and output um, a digital high until the sync pulse uh, needs to be outputted on uh, these wires, uh, then make it low and go high again. And the same for the vertical links. And the timing for these uh, two uh, pulses can be uh, found online, of course. So um, for if uh, SVGA signal 800 by 660 hertz, which was the uh, display um, display that I generated for uh, for Snake. You have this timing, and what's very good about this is um, exactly 40 megahertz. And people that worked with uh, a left FPGA know that that is the the main clock or the basic clock for um, uh, yeah for the FPGA. Which means if you implement this in a single cycle time loop, every cycle of that loop will be updating one pixel on the screen. And uh, down here, you find the exact timings. So uh, for the horizontal line, uh, 0 till 800 or 799 will be the visible line. Then you get the front porch, the sync porch. This is the time that uh, the uh, sync pulse should be 0 or low. And then you go high, high, high again. And um, a whole line takes 165 uh, single cycles exactly. Uh, so you don't have to look at these, uh, this timing. You can just count cycles, which make it uh, very easy to implement uh, displays. Um, the upgrade to Tetris, um, 
so going to 1600 times 1200, which is four times uh, uh, the resolution, is uh, 162 megahertz. The two is a problem, um, so I just chose uh, 60. That uh, makes the 60 hertz go down to uh, 59 hertz, um, but uh, I don't think any human will will notice that. And um, LCD monitors will first buffer a whole screen and then update every pixel instantly. So you will not see the scan line or everything. So the, the snake game was, was 800 uh, times 600 at 60 Hertz. And the Tetris game is 1600 times 1200 uh, at uh, 95 Hertz. OK, so now looking at the specification uh, of the MyRio, if I uh, open the manual, and look at the digital I.O., I can see the minimal pulse width is uh, 20 nanoseconds. And if you do the calculation, you will get at a maximum uh, uh, pulse rate at, uh, of 50 megahertz. But um, as you could see in the video, it still works at 160 megahertz. So the question is why? And I think that an eye guarantees um, signal quality. So if you would watch uh, a pulse, uh, a digital pulse on an oscilloscope, you would see uh, a block signal. Um, but if you do that at 160 megahertz, it will more uh, likely be like a wave. Uh, but luckily, the um, electronics in, in uh, displays and monitors uh, and TVs is uh, very mature, is very well developed, and they handle these kinds of signals uh, very well. So I cannot exactly explain how this um, works, um, but it works. Another thing is the logic level of the digital outputs is 3.3 volts. But if you look at the uh, output level of the VGA signals, it's from 0 to 0 0.7 which means uh, I'm way over the maximum voltage that I theoretically could, uh, that, that I theoretically need to give a, uh, a monitor. But also this is uh, well, um, protected with the electronics in the monitor. So I had no problems there. Um, but this also means that I can only make um, eight colors. So if you have the RGB colors, um, red can only be zero or one. So it can be black or red. Uh, and the same is done for green and uh, blue. And you can mix them. So in total, I can make eight colors. Um, so if you look at the um, MyRio manual, you will see that uh, the FEGA used in there is the Silinx uh, Z7010, uh, which is um, a CPU and an FEGA built in one. And if you look at the uh, Silinx datasheet, you can see uh, the resources that we have available. So um, here on the right side, you see from, uh, the listing from the compile. We have 4,400 slices and about uh, 60 uh, block RAM. Um, the 60 block RAM is why I wanted to show this, because I use block RAM extensively to draw graphics in uh, on the monitor. Because block RAM will store the graphics, I can index the block RAM and then draw the correct colors uh, wherever they want. And if I see, uh, if I look at this FVGA, I have 2.1 megabits of uh, RAM that I can um, use to draw my graphics. This is actually a relatively uh, small FVGA. The MyRio is uh, out for a few years now. If you have a single board Rio, especially the newer generations and the compact uh, Rios and newer generations, you have easily uh, five to 10 times, uh, if not more, uh, of storage and, and slices you can use. Um, <clears throat> but let's say i want to uh, draw a full scale image uh, in eight colors so i have um, 1600 times 1200 this is the amount of pixels and then i can have i need uh, three bits to display the r the g and the, the red green and blue then i need uh, 5.7 million uh, bits stored into block RAM. So if I wanted to store one image in block RAM, I cannot do this because my uh, FVGA block RAM is too small. Um, this is very important because this means I need to do a lot of optimizations in my code. We will go to the uh, code in just a moment and I will show you uh, what tricks I use to get it, uh, to get it working. Um, but basically the 
application is built up out of three loops. The first loop is the 160 megahertz loop, which is responsible of uh, um, X, uh, of, of generating f the colors for uh, four pixels each. No, that's not correct. <clears throat> It is responsible for generating the visa signal, so each iteration it will uh, update one pixel. Uh, the 40 megahertz loop is responsible to tell the 160 megahertz loop which four colors it should uh, draw. Because this is a 160 megahertz loop, I only have 6.25 nanoseconds to run my code, and you can not compile a lot. Uh, the, the compiler will not like you and uh, will it will just not compile. So I have a, a helpful loop that's 40 megahertz. I know I need to um, have logic in here that gives me four colors for uh, the next four pixels, uh, which will transfer to the 160 megahertz loop. And then I have a normal while loop, which I am running the uh, the game logic. So it's, it uh, runs for all four players, the, the, the Tetris game logic. Okay, so I need to switch now to the uh, virtual machine. So let me see. And share. So if everything went right, you will now see a, a desktop with a project library. Um, can you guys in chat say if everything is all right, team? Yes, okay, everything's all right. So you see the project library. Um, you can see here is uh, my uh, my reel. I don't know what it's doing right now. Yes, my reel. Um, I have the um, 40 megahertz onboard clock and I created uh, a derivative clock of 160 megahertz, which is yeah, four times the 40 megahertz, of course. Um, if I open the um, uh, main VI, we can see the four uh, VIs that I was just talking about. The first one being the um, uh, Visa's uh, single loop. And this is uh, what we are using to uh, generate the, the pixel. So every iteration of this uh, 160 megahertz loop, I will output one pixel on the monitor. Um, I'm using a Z called pipe lighting using a technique called pipelining um, and I have a, a, a counter this is not nothing more than a counter so it counts uh, the 20 uh, 1 and 60 pixels that is needed for one line and outputs me an enable when um, the vertical counter should count so this this is used to determine which pixel I'm actually updating I'm inserting an extra iteration because I need to do four iterations for each one of the 40 megahertz iterations. So I'm, I'm putting one uh, extra in here and then I'm outputting the, uh, the, the pixel. So again, we have to connect us. We have the five uh, digital outputs, red, green, and blue. Um, and I, yes, uh, the horizontal sync and the vertical sync. And I'm using a pixel FIFO to communicate from the 40 megahertz to the 160 megahertz. So this FIFO will receive the four colors that need to be displayed uh, from the 40 megahertz uh, loop. And um, I did some optimization here to get it compiled because again, I only, this I all executes in 6.25 nanoseconds. Um, but in the first iteration, I get the three uh, pixels or the three pixel uh, value, sorry. I get the RGB colors for the pixels that I'm updated, so the RGB. Uh, the second iteration, I get second three, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that way I have four uh, pixels that I displayed on the on the screen. I have to make, make sure that I'm outputting in the visual area. So I have uh, zero to 15, 1599 horizontal and 0 to 1199 vertical. And I'm using this to make absolutely sure that I'm not updating pixels in the uh, time that the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, that the electromagnet or the, 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 the electro cannon is going from the right side of the screen to the left side. Because if you're using a CRT monitor, you will actually damage it because you're now shooting um, electrons where you don't want to have them. And LCD monitors, I find, have a security mechanism where the screen just goes blank. Um, so I put here this, this ANT uh, security 
gates to make sure that I'm absolutely not putting any pixels outside of the visible area. And then here I have the sync pulse. This is uh, the timing uh, that I can get from uh, the timing uh, here. Um, so it's, it's basically every time high. And then when I come in the sync uh, range, I pull it low. And that tells the monitor that I'm outputting 1600 or 1200 at, uh, at 50 hertz. So if you just use this, um, you have a black screen. And uh, if you ask the monitor for information, it will display you uh, that you are uh, creating a 600 times 1200 uh, signal. So that was the, um, uh, the generating. But now we need to decide um, what color each pixel has. And this is this loop. So let me clear this a little bit up. And let me open this one. <clears throat> so uh, in my present, uh, in, the, in the power sheet, in the PowerPoint sheets, I told you that it's not possible to uh, display a whole image because I simply do not have enough block RAM to store the image. So this means I need to do clever things to um, save block RAM. And uh, one thing that I do is uh, just store little parts of the image that I want to display so I can save space. So if you, for instance, look here, the VI Technologies logo is a, a, a color logo. So every pixel has three bits value, RGB. And I only store uh, enough that I can display uh, this logo. If you look at the astronaut and the text here, these are, um, they are only black and white. So I can store this at one bit and need to do some clever um, uh, wiring to make sure it's it's white or blue or whatever color I want. Um, and using these, these techniques, I'm saving uh, space because this black area, I do not have to save in block ramp because I'm simply not drawing anything here. These um, rectangles that you see down here are actually done programmatically. So I'm not saving anything in block ramp. I'm just um, asking is uh, the pixel that I'm currently updating inside or in range of this rectangle? If yes, then uh, draw the color. Um, and then the, uh, the biggest part, of course, is the game itself, but we will come back to that later. Um, so this is the, the 40 megahertz loop that tells uh, the 160 megahertz loop, which four pixels are we updating? Um, which means every iteration of this loop, we have to uh, give out four for the RGB values of four pixels. This VI is the same as the two counters we saw in the other loop, but because it's only a 40 megahertz loop, I can uh, put the code uh, some more, what's more together. And in this cluster, I'm outputting the, um, uh, the horizontal pixel and the vertical pixel that I'm currently updating. And each of these parallel VIs need to decide for themselves if the pixel that is currently updating is for them and what color um, it should, uh, should have. For instance, if I have uh, the astronaut VI, this is this one, it decides if uh, the astronaut should be drawn. This is the um, position of the astronaut on the screen. So I first check if the pixel that is being drawn is inside this range. If so, I update a counter and read out uh, my block RAM that has the information, that contains the information of uh, the pixels that should be uh, uh, displayed on the screen. So how you do that is you create a block memory in your project. So right click, uh, new memory, and I have here the, the astronaut memory. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it has a size, it has a name. Uh, what's important is that uh, cycles of read latency is set to one because we are reading this in a single cycle time loop and at default it's uh, set to two. But if I do this, um, it will not work. It will not compile because it needs two cycles to read in, instead of one. Um, it will ask you to pipeline the output, um, which is not visible in my VI here, but it is there. I can show that uh, in, in just a moment. Um, the data, data type is fixed point because each iteration of this loop, I need to output four uh, pixels. So I output four bits, which is my, uh, and each bit is one pixel that uh, I need to display. Um, the interface of both read because I'm not writing to the, the block RAM, I'm just reading is only uh, a ROM basically. And I have uh, an initial values with contain the data, which contains the data of uh, the astronaut. And to store this data, um, you have to make a, 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 a VI that basically 
outputs the data of uh, the astronaut. I can show you this. So this, um, let me show these are my lookup tables that I use for the for the initial values of all the block memories. Uh, so I have one for the astronaut. If I run this, it uh, basically loads an image, a simple P PNG image, and um, formats it in a way that I can use it to store in uh, the block memory as an initial value. I get extra information here, uh, which you have to provide yourself, so you have to do some programming. Uh, but I load uh, the PNG into memory. I uh, have uh, loops that will make sure that I put four pixels in one fixed point and I output the initial data um, that is then stored into the block RAM. Um, yes. <clears throat> so another um, thing that I shown was the rectangles, which are, do, which are done uh, programmatically. Those are these here, the draw rectangles. Uh, these just check again if the active pixel that is currently being drawn is inside a boundary. If so, then uh, depending on the player, uh, because I'm using this VI, I select the color. So this is red, this is green, blue, and uh, magenta. Uh, and this is going on the output. Um, so then there is uh, additional logic uh, here, which is very easy to explain. Because if you, um, I'm drawing the astronaut here, but the game board is actually overlain and this is, uh, is, is an overlay. So the game board um, will always be drawn instead of the uh, astronaut. Uh, and that's basically the, the logic that you can see here. Okay. Um, I will come back for the play field because that one is uh, more complicated, but the other parts of the uh, display are all using the same kind of technique. So loading from block RAM is either three color or uh, one color to, to save space. And you can basically uh, define your uh, display how you want. So now we go back to the main VI. The last loop is the normal game loop. Uh, there it goes. Yes. <clears throat> so this is a, a, a state machine. This state machine runs the game for all four players. Um, in this array of clusters, I have four states. So uh, there are four elements. You can see here. There, there are four elements, and each of the player has its own set of uh, of data. And what is happening is. Uh, it will update the state for uh, player one. Then this VI will select player two and it will update the state for player two. Then player three, player four, player one, two, three, four, one. Um, so this is how I also save space. I have one state machine for all four of the players. Uh, now, if I go to the documentation, I have, uh, let me see, state diagram. So this is the, uh, uh, the state diagram that I'm using, um, every state is one case in my case structure, and you can see the uh, the values that are needed for the transition. So we start the game, and we are waiting for the player to uh, press uh, um, the button on the joystick. So if the joystick button is true, it will initialize the game, which will uh, reset the score, uh, clear the board, etc. Then it will create the first uh, tetramino, so the, for, the first Tetris block, and place it on the draw play field. Um, I will come back uh, for the differences between game and draw play field. But the draw play field is basically uh, a part of the block RAM that is reserved, that is drawn uh, on the screen. Then I will update the score. Um, so the, the score on the display will be zero. Um, check, check of the game is game over, because the game over state is if I create a new tetromino and it is uh, in collision with the stack, so the, the, the blocks that are already placed on the play field, the game is over. It will freeze the game for a few seconds and then get up here where um, uh, it is waiting again for the player to, to start the game. But if it's not game over, um, we check the drop timer, which is an internal timer that uh, makes sure the uh, block drops down after uh, after one second when the game starts, but if you uh, start clearing more rows, it will go faster. Um, if the drop timer did not elapse, it will check the joystick for input. If the user is doing nothing, it will check the timer again. It will basically wait here till something happens. Um, now, if the user um, 
does something with the joystick, it will first check if that what the user wants to do uh, is a collision. So for instance, if you're on the left side of the screen and you want to go one uh, block more left, so you basically are on the left border, it will not do that because um, you are in collision with the left border. Um, so it will ignore your inputs and start the drop timer, timer again, etc. But if there is uh, no collision, so coll the collision is false, it will move the tetanomino to the new position, then um, do a copy. Um, okay, I, I need to explain the difference between the game and the draw play field. So the game uh, play field basically only contains the stack, the, um, the blocks that are um, not falling down. And the draw play field contains the stack and the uh, block that is currently uh, being used. Um, <clears throat> so by copying the game to the draw, it basically removes the, the falling block. And um, now I place, so I go here, now I place the um, Tatnomino on the draw field, which makes it visible again. Then I update the score and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are two cases, which is basically dropping the block onto the stack, um, which is placing the block, um, yeah, which is placing the block on the stack. So what, what we need to do here is uh, check if we have any full lines, um, remove those lines. Then I added a check for a perfect clear. So if, uh, if you clear the whole board, so there's nothing on it again, uh, you get 20 extra points. Then I copy again the game to the draw play field and uh, create a new Tatomino and etc. cetera. So um, yeah, this is the state machine and the state machine is uh, used here. So if you um, open uh, or see the case selector, you can see all the cases that are visible in the state diagram. Um, and every function is, uh, is, is programmed here. I can maybe explain um, the block ROM a little bit better for this. So this is how the game is basically uh, built up at the moment. Because an, FV an left view FPGA only supports 1D arrays and not 2D arrays, you basically have a long 1D array where you do all your uh, manipulations on. So the game field is uh, 10 uh, by 20. So it's basically a 1D array from 0 to 199 uh, um, elements and uh, I created a gameplay field a block RAM which contains all the four game uh, fields for each uh, of the players. So uh, this is player one and from 200 there's player two etc. And I created four single draw play fields which are the uh, uh, which is basically a copy of the game play field plus the uh, block that I'm currently uh, using to draw it on screen. These are all the possible uh, tetrominoes uh, you can use, and um, all are, are built up out of four blocks. So I can store these offsets, uh, these offsets, also in block memory. So if I have this block and I uh, create an origin at zero zero, I can store this block in memory as um, an offset of ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. So if this block would be located with an origin of zero, so um, here, and I add an offset of 10, the block would be actually visible at 10, 11, 12, and 13. And I can do that for um, all these blocks. This is also how I check collision, because if my origin of this block is at zero, um, it is actually on 10, 11, 12, and 13. So if I wanted to go left, I check um, the first, can I go left? No, because um, from 10 to nine is not uh, not allowed. Um, so I have a collision. I will actually also check if 11 to 10 is possible, 12, et cetera. But because one of the four blocks is uh, um, in collision, the whole movement um, is uh, ignored, or if it, if it was a movement down, it will be, um, uh, um, it will be deployed and a new block will be uh, created. Um, yes. So, <clears throat> um, let me see. Yeah, so, so one thing that I'm using uh, for creating uh, a tetnomino, I need a, a randomizer. 
And what I'm using here is the noise generator, uh, which is uh, uh, a native function from uh, for left your FVGA toolkit. So if you're using left your FVGA, you can use this. Uh, I'm creating a random number uh, from minus four to three. Uh, I actually only have seven tetrominoes, so uh, this these are eight possible combinations. So I need to ignore one. Um, and I create a random seed by uh, reading out the tick count, which the FVGA is currently on. And the tick count is random because remember, we are iterating from player one to player two to player three, and all of them are in a different state. There is actually a, a, a difference in when the users are using their joystick. So this is, um, this is random. And it's, it's, um, <clears throat> so there are Tetris games which give you all blocks in the same amount, so they, they monitor uh, how much, uh, how often you get a, a block type. So you will get all blocks at the same amount. This will not do this. This can do this. It can be. A, it can take a long time before you get uh, the, the favorite long block uh, that that will save you uh, in, in in the game. Um, so. Martin, are there any questions of parts of the code that uh, people want to see or uh, want to go in more detail, detail in? Not yet. Um, <clears throat> so what's what's the time? So I think I'm basically done with, with my presentation. So um, you can also download uh, the source code for uh, Tetris. It's in the uh, description of the YouTube channel. Um, it's, it's free of use. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. It should be relatively easy to port this to uh, another um, Rio architecture, so a Compact Rio of a PXI. What you need is um, at least five digital inputs for the joystick, for at least one joystick, and uh, five digital outputs for the uh, phaser signal. And then you can make this, uh, this, this running again. You can maybe show the joystick um, uh, logic. Let me see. Uh, check it again. Check the time. I that collision. Oh, it's here. Yeah, I combined two states here because the wait state is waiting for uh, a button down, and the the check joystick is waiting for any uh, joystick. And to save resources, I put them in the same uh, uh, case because the, the digital inputs here will be compiled only one time. Um, <clears throat> so again, when I was compiling this, and maybe I could show this. Uh, show display composition zones. I hope it will show it. Yes, it will still show it. Um, if you look at the uh, final utilization, I'm at 100% uh, of, uh, of slices. Um, Slices consist of uh, registers and lookup tables. But if you look at these two resources, I'm only using 35% of the registers and 48% uh, for 85 percent of the lookup tables. So it's not, um, the, there is still room, but uh, I have difficulties getting this uh, to compile. Um, the block RAMs, um, I only using 65%, so I can do uh, much more here. And uh, the DSPs, which are multiplications, uh, I try to minimize from the uh, from the start. So I'm only using seven of the 80 that, uh, that I'm having. Um, uh, but because I was having difficulties getting this compiled, I have um, created one VI for all the four joysticks. And um, I have a case structure depending on the player who uh, needs to have uh, the input read uh, to select the, the digital uh, IO. So I have five digital inputs for uh, joystick one. Um, then I, de uh, I have a, a inverter because it's a pull down, uh, no, a pull up resistor. So if nothing happens, the inputs are high. If the joystick is moved, the input that is uh, directly connected to that move uh, is that uh, gets set to zero or to false. So I need to invert it. Then I have a debounce uh, function. Um, yeah, and then depending on the input, I will uh, output it. And then the next input that I need to have is a none. So if I do uh, a direction on the joystick, 
The next input this uh, VI wants to have is a none. So you have to release the joystick and get it back to a neutral state before you can do the next input. This gives you uh, extreme precision when controlling the blocks, because if you do one time left, the block will go one block left and not more than that. I have to release the joystick or, uh, yeah, release the joystick, and then I could can do the next one. And that, that, works, uh, that works very well. Um, I'm still having troubles with the uh, debounce uh, values. Uh, as you can see, I am waiting for uh, 20,000 uh, ticks. So this is, a, this is a single cycle time loop at 40 megahertz. Um, so this is 20,000 times 25 nanoseconds, which is still too fast. I think I need to um, basically add a zero here, add a zero in the timeout of this loop. And then uh, we will not have any debounce issues in the in the choices again, and um, yeah, we will be uh, displaying this um, on the next NI days, NI weeks, whatever will be uh, next, uh, uh, depending on the current situation. Um, but uh, if you see this, please come to us, uh, play. We will have an amazing prize for the uh, um, yeah for the for the people that will get the highest score. And um, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. Are there uh, any questions? Um, I see one question. So you already programmed Snake and Tetris. Do you have concrete ideas about which games to program next? Yeah, so I want to um, always uh, increase the stakes. I'm working on one project, which I'm not ready to announce yet. But I already uh, ordered uh, uh, light guns. Uh, so the, 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 the NAS, if you know the NAS game, uh, the, the, the duck hunt uh, gun, you can actually not use the guns that were um, delivered um, with uh, the, 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 the Nintendo Entertainment System because it compensates for the CRT scan that the monitors in that time had. Uh, so if you will use the, the light gun on the on an LCD, it will actually detect nothing and uh, it will not work. So a light gun, if you press uh, the trigger, it will send a digital pulse, pulse and uh, the screen will go black and there will be a white square. And the gun will actually look for that square. If it detects it, you basically hit your target and you get another signal back from the gun. If you miss it, the gun will just not reply and you know you miss. Um, and um, I'm still looking what game exactly to make. Uh, Dog Hunt would be obvious, but uh, there are a lot of uh, other possibilities. Um, but that will be uh, a long time out if even I will ever do it. Um, if you go to the snake uh, blog, so in the description, and if you go to the VR Technologies website, um, go to the blog and then snake on FPGA, you will find the VIs that are needed uh, for just generating an 800 by 600 signal. And you can concentrate on the logic for whatever you want to display. Um, I'm also looking into a, a library where you can visualize uh, the voltage measured on an analog input, for instance, or monitor the digital outputs. So you can use uh, this library to in your in your real time in your in your, in your projects to debug the FPGA without uh, influencing the RT or setting up uh, a data stream or whatever. So you only need at least uh, three digital outputs: so the horizontal sync, the vertical sync, and uh, one pixel color and you can wire it on the connector to either be it black and white or black and red or whatever you want. Uh, and then you can display the uh, actual voltage that is measured on a digital, uh, on an analog input of the, uh, of the FPGA. So you get some kind of, uh, of feedback. Okay, so I think we have come uh, to the end of this. Thank you everyone uh, for, uh, viewing our first online .log meeting. I hope we will do more of these. Uh, uh, keep viewing your uh, social media post for uh, more information. And um, if you have any questions, please mail them to us. All the slides, all the information that you have seen during these three uh, presentations will be in the description of this uh, YouTube video. It will also be on the uh, .log community thread. Uh, find your own user group. It's, it's very important for your own career, for your own understanding for LabVIEW, and it will make your life better because 
every one of us has been struggling with solving some codes and what is hard for you is maybe very easy for somebody else. You can give you one tip, one VI and you're um, uh, happy again. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much everyone and um, maybe see you uh, next time. Bye.